presentation by Westchester Power. Yep, let me get uh, Jasmine Graham. No, I have been, we did the wrong one. Sorry. <laughs> Put somebody on the spot uh, who can't present. Sorry. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I know. All right. Things jump around sometimes. So, all right. I'll try this again here. Okay. Jasmine? Ah, uh, there she is. Hello. Hello. So Jasmine Graham from, uh, well, Westchester Power, Sustainable Westchester. So um, did you have anything you wanted to share or are you just going to? Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. I've got a presentation okay. ready. Let me, uh, let me make it so you can do that. Hold on. Okay. Okay. All yours. All right. Thank you. All right, so hi, I am Jasmine Graham and I'm here from Westchester Power, Sustainable Westchester. Sorry, just setting up my screen. All right, um, so just a brief reminder, Sustainable Westchester, we're a nonprofit um, based in Mount Kisco and 45, 44 out of 45 municipalities in Westchester are members. So everything you see in blue there and then the county itself. Uh, we run several programs to help municipalities be more environmentally sustainable in economically efficient ways. In the renewable energy sector, we have the Westchester Power Community Choice Aggregation Program, which I'll talk about today. We also have Community Solar, which helps people to sign up for local solar projects without having to put solar on their roof. Um, we have our Heat Smart Program, which helps to get more um, air and ground source heat pumps, as well as geothermal energy um, and energy efficiency for residents and commercial businesses. Our clean transportation pro project gets discounts on electric vehicles and charging infrastructure. And the zero waste program um, is most notably uh, the Recycle Right app, which um, helps municipalities and the residents to improve their recycling, reduce costs and improve waste management. But as I said before, today I'm here to talk about Westchester Power. And essentially Westchester Power allows municipalities to take charge of their energy decision-making. So we're able to set criteria that energy companies must meet in order to supply the program. We educate and advocate for clean energy and we really try to position Westchester for a resilient future in the face of global warming and climate change. In the Westchester Power Program, there's currently 27 municipalities, 24 of which, including Irvington, are in the green supply. And there are about 115,000 residents and small businesses overall. The big reason why we do this, the reason why this program is so important is because of the environmental impact. So program-wide, we've offset over 650,000 metric tons of CO2. But of course, nobody knows what a metric ton of CO2 looks like or feels like. So we put that into some more tangible terms. So that's equivalent to taking over 141,000 cars off the road for a year or planting 10.8 million tree seedlings and growing them for 10 years. Um, and so within Irvington, you all have offset 19,568 metric tons of CO2, which is equivalent to taking over 4,200 cars off the road for a year or planting over 323,000 tree seedlings and growing them for 10 years. So among the many benefits of the Westchester Power Program, there are, it's the fact that we are a vetted community program. So we're a nonprofit, as I mentioned before, we're not an ESCO. Um, our goal here is to expand access to renewable energy and there's no terminations, penalties, um, no type of fees related, um, and no surprises. So uh, many people will sign up with an ESCO and get a low introductory rate, and then they see their rate increase um, after that introductory period. Nothing like that happens in this program. You always receive notice of any new pricing, um, and we're really here to be helpful to the consumer. On the financial side, we set what's called a not to exceed bid cap. So when we go out for bids with energy companies, there's a price that they cannot exceed. Usually it's the previous 12 or 24 month utility average. And we have a fixed rate. So when you're with the utility, 
you pay whatever the market rate for electricity is on the day that they read your meter. Um, but with this program, you have the same rate every month for the supply portion of your bill and you know what you're gonna pay. And because we have so many uh, residents and small businesses in the program, we're able to get competitive prices and particularly for renewable energy. One of the biggest reasons why we do this is because of the advocacy and education. Um, we are <laughs> typically in the office Monday through Friday, although most of us are still remote right now, um, but you can still give us a call nine to five Monday through Friday or email us uh, at info at sustainablewestchester.org. Um, and a big part of what we do is educating people on green energy, on the importance of green energy, how to read their electricity bills, how to get out of predatory ESCO contracts. And um, we take as much time as needed every time. I think my personal best is like an hour and four minutes. <laughs> um, and I've made a house call pre-coronavirus to help someone sign up for community solar. Um, so we're really here to help. Uh, so please do give us a call if you have any questions. And we are happy because we now have in-house Spanish language customer service. But as I said before, the reason why this program is so important is for mitigating climate change. Um, not only do we help municipalities to meet their climate goals, and as I said before, we've offset hundreds of thousands of metric tons of CO2, um, but participating in the CCA as um, while being in the green supply can help communities achieve clean energy community certification and also position uh, municipalities for grants. And importantly, we really have a seat at the table now. Um, we are always in conversation with NYSERDA, New York State Energy Research Development Authority, um, and DPS, the Department of Public Service, about the future of energy here in Westchester and New, New York State. And they really do look to us uh, for creative solutions. So it's really great to have a seat at the table that represents Westchester. On the financial side, as I mentioned before, we have fixed rates. And so as you'll see, um, these are the current rates. So for the green supply, it's 7.96 cents per kilowatt hour. For the basic supply, it's 7.71 cents per kilowatt hour. Almost everyone in Irvington is in the green supply. And that falls under what was the previous 12 month Con Ed average when we went out to bid. Uh, the rates this past year um, have really dropped um, in part because of reduced demand because of COVID, um, in part because of low natural gas and oil prices. Um, but you will see at the tail end of the graph that Con Ed's rates have really dropped to a historic low. However, when we're comparing our rate to Con Ed, we have to always remember that it's not apples to apples. Our rate is 100% New York State hydropower, um, whereas the utility is largely non-renewable. So if you go on the Department of Public Service Power to Choose website and type in similar contract terms, 24 months, no cancellation fee, 100% renewable, you'll see rates 8.7 cents or 14.99 cents, which is almost double um, what, what we pay here. So uh, we do know that we have a, a comparable uh, rate and a competitive rate uh, compared to green energy options that someone could get by themselves. And so when we look at Irvington, this is by the numbers, this is the most recent contract. We are behind the utility by about $293,000. Um, but then if you look on the right, you'll see that over the length of both of the contracts, um, we still are net positive. And so this is a closer look at those numbers. And so since 2016, when Irvington first joined the program, um, we are still net positive by $129,000 um, while avoiding 19,568 tons of CO2. On a per account basis, that means that most of the residential customers, which are mainly in the green supply, are behind the utility by about $10 a month. Um, in this most recent contract. But since the program started, um, they are still net positive, even given the losses in the most recent contract by about $2 a month. So overall, Irvington has saved about $130,000, served 66.5 million kilowatt hours and offset nearly 20,000 tons of CO2. But importantly, 
Westchester Power is a foundation for further initiatives. So we've signed up a lot of people for Community Solar, which I mentioned before, allows people to, um, to sign up for a solar project in the same utility zone without having to put any solar onto their own roof. Um, so this is particularly good for people who have shady roofs or live in a multifamily home where they don't have um, control over what goes on their roof. And community solar is really exciting because there's a guaranteed 10% discount on the solar credits that you receive. Um, right now, this is through a two bill scenario um, just because of regulatory constraints, um, which makes it not viable for everyone. You know, you have to be able to do auto pay and have a checking account. But we're really excited because beginning in uh, early 2021 next year, um, the PSC has ordered that utilities like Con Edison have to provide consolidated billing, which means that people can uh, get the benefits of community solar and just see them on their Con Ed bill instead of having to pay two bills. Um, and that means that we can offer these credits and these discounts at, on an opt-out basis. So this can be um, integrated with the um, CCA program. And as it stands already, you can both be in the CCA and sign up for community solar and double your, typically your financial benefits and your renewable energy impact. And of course, community solar is a more localized form of renewable energy. And so it's particularly valuable in um, climate resilience. And we're a launch pad for groundbreaking programs. So, Right now, we've got a pilot program for a demand response, which essentially allows people to reduce their usage during peak times. So as we know right now, it's really hot. There's a lot of usage. Um, and so you would actually get notified um, by the utility um, to maybe just turn your thermostat up a few degrees and you can save money. Um, we hope to roll that out further. In summer is the most desirable time for a demand response program. So definitely by next year, um, but it could be earlier. Our long-term goal is we want a direct supply. So right now we have New York State hydropower through renewable energy certificates, but we really want to be able to build new renewable energy in the Northern part of the state and bring that directly to Westchester via a transmission line so that the actual electrons here on our local grid are green. And we're also piloting new models so um, at our office at 40 Green Street, uh, <laughs> a, a, a good address for us, um, we are integrating community solar, battery storage, electric vehicle charging, and we're actually adding geothermal as well uh, to create a really um, resilient and integrated system. So we do hope to pilot models like that around the county. And a big part of the reason why we're here today is because of the renewal. So this is a little recap of where we've been and where we're going. Uh, Irvington joined in 2016 when there were 20 municipalities in the program. As of 2019, we have 27 municipalities in the program and we re when we renewed the contracts. And um, this year we have another renewal and we really want to increase our renewable energy impact. So, just like before, we have um, a few criteria, key criteria for the bidding process. The first is that we want two supply rates, a green supply and a basic supply. We still want fixed rates uh, to protect against any volatility in the market. We always set a not to exceed price, um, which will be determined in unison with the municipalities. And we will continue our commitment to New York State RECs, Renewable Energy Certificates. And there is an exciting new element, which is a reverse auction. And so essentially in the past, suppliers would bid blindly against each other and just hope that they've submitted the best rate. Um, we've gone back to them and you know said, give us your best rate and then they'll give us a second one. But with this, they'll actually be able to see um, when they're being outbid. And so it, um, it allows the price to be driven down and it even has um, a, a clause or a, um, a, a feature where if someone bids within the last like two minutes, it extends the auction by 15 minutes. Uh, so we do think that this will drive the price down. And there's uh, quite a few steps to get to the renewal. Most of it is behind the scenes that we're doing. Um, and so the key dates and milestones are in August there is the Memorandum of Understanding, the MOU, 
That's the document that sets out the criteria that I just talked about, most notably the not to exceed price. Um, and so in August, we'll be asking municipalities to sign that. As long as the bids meet that criteria, then um, you'll go ahead and participate. And in early September, the request for proposal or the RFP will go out. And um, as I mentioned before, there'll be that uh, new reverse auction bid. By the end of September, we will know the new rate. In early November, notification letters will be mailed just as they had been in the past to residents. And it'll, again, they'll have a 30 day opt out period, um, but they can opt out anytime thereafter with no penalty. And beginning on January 1st, um, residents and small businesses will be enrolled on a rolling basis based on, on a rolling basis based on their meter read date. Um, until then, we're doing outreach and education. It's a big part of what we do. We have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for social media. Um, sometimes we're in the press. We have created a new YouTube channel, Sustainable Westchester Media, where we have educational videos on what is the CCA, how to read your Con Edison bill, um, as well as frequently asked questions. So I do encourage people to check that out if they have more questions. And um, we are happy to do any kind of virtual um, information sessions. I think we're all getting a little too familiar with Zoom, but we're happy to hop on a Zoom with anyone at any point. Um, and then we will be transitioning to in-person events um, when that is feasible. So that is the end of my presentation. I will stop sharing so that we can all see each other. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Can you talk a little bit about um, how the pricing will work? The uh, you know like with the bidding, uh, obviously the bidding is is new, um, but what's the goal in the pricing? So I remember the first time uh, through one of the nice or the one of the the nice features was not only was it green, but it was also going to save people money. Is that kind of the same goal now? Absolutely, always our goal. <laughs> always our goal to go green and save people money. In the past, we've used the previous twelve month or twenty four month utility average. So when we went out to bid last time, the average con ed rate was 8.26 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, that's for non-renewable energy, just what's on the grid. Um, and we got that rate of 7.96 cents. Because the con ed rate has dropped so dramatically in recent months, it's pretty unlikely that we'll be able to do the previous 12 month average because we'd likely not get compliant bids. Um, however, we are, in conversation with energy pricing analysts. And basically what we've learned is that um, the rate can't stay in the seller forever. Um, it's, it's likely gonna go back up. We know that um, in, the, in April of next year, the last Indian Point unit is going to close. Um, and um, that's one of the many factors in which um, are probably going to be driving the price up. So we don't yet know what that not to exceed price is. If we wanted, we could say the not to exceed price is 7.96 cents. You know, you have to be our current rate today. Um, but that's a conversation that we have with the municipalities. Um, and we'll be doing that within a basically the next two weeks. We'll reach out um, and, and have those discussions. Great. So we'll be on the lookout for some paperwork, right, Larry? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, that's fine. We will turn it around. Um, I had a question for Jasmine. Um, if somebody in Irvington um, isn't sure if they're actually in this, like they had an ESCO already and they didn't become part of this, what would they do? You could call our office, 914-242-4725. Mm -hmm. um, right now in Con Ed territory, the... Uh, yeah. The supplier is Constellation New Energy. So that is what you would see on your bill. Usually on page three, there's your electricity supply details mm -hmm. and you would see Constellation New Energy there. Um, and um, I mean, there could be a chance that you're already with Constellation in a private contract, but for most people, if they see that, it's a pretty surefire sign that they're in the program. Um, but if you have any, you know, questions, people can always reach out to us by phone or by email. Okay. Thanks. Great. Well, thank you very much for uh, zooming in tonight. Uh, we appreciate your time and um, clarity of the presentation and we look forward to talking to you soon. 
Thank you so much for having me. Have a great night. Thank you. you Thank too. you, Jasmine. Bye. 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 So now, now back to the mundane um, announcements. We have uh, several checks over twenty five thousand um, dollars. The first one was was I guess back in June. It was uh, for JC Land and Site Development for Matheson Park renovation. It was fifty six thousand one hundred fifty seven dollars and thirty five cents that it came from the capital fund. Then back uh, later in June, June nineteenth, we had two. Um, one was Don Brown bus sales for the new senior bus, also from the capital fund. That was $74,670. We also had Montesano Brothers DPW paving from the capital fund. That was $28,411.86. And moving on to June 26th, uh, we had Crichton Manning Engineering LLP, which is for the Station Road Main Street Pedestrian Improvements uh, from the capital fund. That was $38,947.01. And last but not least, uh, from Friday, July 10th, the Matheson Park Playground Equipment from the Capital Fund, another payment of $36,370.75. Uh, quick update on, on Matheson Park. Um, we kind of had a tour uh, with the uh, developer and the, um, the contractor and the designer uh, and the rec department and, and RPAC. Um, Great progress. I think the um, they've had to adapt some to uh, you know conditions in the ground, or you know not having to you know stretch uh, piping as long as they they necessarily you know didn't want to have to. Um, so they've adapted, but they've overcome. Um, looks like it's still probably the construction piece will be on schedule for kind of end of September, hopefully, uh, if they don't have any major snags. Um, I think one thing that we have to remember is that even when the construction's done. Uh, they have to kind of replant uh, the, the, you know, the, the fields um, and then let that rest. So it looks at like my best guess is it won't be open until September. I'm sorry, uh, won't be open until um, the following spring. Uh, how early in spring, I'm not sure. But, you know, uh, depending on how, how severe the winter is and, and that, that sort of thing, how, you know, how quickly they're able to get the um, the uh, construction done and start the replantings, but yeah, it looks great. The uh, playground is unbelievable. It, to me, it's again, it's always hard for me to visualize something on plans. Um, the playground is a lot bigger uh, than, I, than I pictured it and it looks great. The, um, the new, it's not called wave, what's it called? The uh, spray machine? No, uh, spray park? Spray splash park. pad. Splash pad um, has like 13 different programmable splash pad <laughs> settings, uh, kind of like sprays and things. So. I think it's going to be great when it's uh, when it's open, and you know, hopefully, a year from now, a lot of people are, are using it and having a great time. So, uh, but things are going well there. Uh, did you want to give a quick update, Larry, on on either, any other other projects that that are going on, either Main Street or Station Road? Um, kind of putting you a little on the spot, but if you want, no, to that's okay. Give you a quick sure. update since we were talking yeah, about of some of the, the funding that we've spent on it. Yeah, exactly. A lot of money going out. Um, well, I mean, obviously, the station road part of the station road sidewalk project is uh, on hold. Um, you know, the, the sidewalks basically done along station road, except for a stretch right against the brook. There's been some engineering challenges and some redesign that had to happen. Uh, and so there's a permit that has been applied for from the DEC in order to do work uh, in and adjacent to that brook. Um, so we're, we are expecting approval, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, and then they can restart and, uh, and get that section finished. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to make predictions on it. So we'll say maybe over the course of the next month or so, they can get, get back to, to doing that. Um, in the meantime, they've spent a lot of time on main street. Anyone that goes to the downtown has seen what's happened. And, it, and by the way, it's not just us working. It's also Con Edison down in the, uh, cotton uh, lower main street area as well. So, we're trying to uh, hopscotch over each other, but it, it creates a rather hectic scene. Um, but they're making progress. Uh, it's difficult. Um, you know, the grades are very difficult, as you know, <laughs> being on Main Street and uh, trying to comply with ADA and all that. So it's it's a uh, it's it's an interesting project. But that should proceed um, through the summer into September. I don't know what exact timing after that. We haven't seen the updated schedule. And how about the Con Ed work? Is that also through the end of the summer? I don't think so. No, I thought that that should be winding down, at least in the major part of the work. And then uh, I know that there's some repaving work that has to be done, uh, which we're trying to put off for a bit to, so that we're not tripping on that either, you know. Um, so, yeah, hopefully kind of 
Uh, I'll get a better update on that, but I don't know the exact timing right now. Okay. Well, thanks for that. Yeah, just to extend the question about the Main Street, are some of the areas that will be bulb outs not yet started? I mean, there are, there are quite a few corners, but maybe some of them actually haven't begun. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think they've gotten to every corner yet. That's I mean, but every corner, well, not not the Astor Street corners, um, uh, and not the upper part of Main Street, but the from Ferris on down are all being addressed. Mm -hmm. at some point. Yeah, thanks. Okay. All right, great. Thanks, Larry. Uh, <laughs> next up is a public hearing to consider a local law amending the use of gas-powered leaf blowers for Monday, August 17th, 2020 at 7 p.m. in Village Hall. Um, Marianne, did you want to give us a little preview of this? Or Yeah. Um, it, it, pretty straightforward. In short, it uh, bans uh, gas-powered leaf blowers altogether after uh, December 16th, the significance of December 16th being that that's the um, uh, end of the winter season where it's so the, the fall cleanup where it's allowed now. So starting on December 16th, it will, um, you can't use operate or permit to be used or operate in any gas powered leaf blower at any time. No exceptions, that's the law. Until then, until then, the law is pretty much the same as, as it is. I, I had to make a, a few changes in the language here to make it make sense, but pretty much that's, that's the only change. And then um, the other change is in the penalty provision, and the board may want to discuss this a little bit. We had some discussion about it, but you may want to change it. So um, it would before if if you violated the leaf blower provision, your um, fine was hundred dollars for the first offense and two hundred and fifty for any subsequent offense. And um, under okay, and and those numbers would change to uh, two hundred and fifty for the first offense and five hundred for any subsequent offense. Um, and the other thing is under the previous. No, the current law, the law that's in effect now, is only the property owner or the person on whose, if it's a tenant, the person on whose property, the, uh, and usually we're not talking about tenants in multifamily buildings, but somebody who rents somebody's house. Um, they're the person who gets um, uh, charged with the fine. Under this, under the law now, any person found guilty of violating it, meaning the operator of the gas powered leaf blower, plus plus the owner uh, could be fined. And that's it, that's it. Yep, well, we'll have some discussion on that, but uh, otherwise I'll make a motion to have a public hearing to consider a local law amending the use of gas powered leaf blowers for Monday, August 17th, 2020 at 7 p.m. in Village Hall, if I can have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right, on to correspondence of which we have uh, quite a bit. Um, let me uh, pull this up here. I'm trying to be green and not uh, print everything out. It doesn't always uh, <laughs> make for an efficient meeting, but um, we'll get there. Uh, let's see. All right. Um, first up, we have uh, Allison and Nicholas Moore. Uh, let's see. At the scroll, sorry. Think of all the paper I saved. All right, here we go. Um, <clears throat> dear members of the Architecture Review Board and Village Trustees, we are residents of Nine Hancock Place, across the street from the Okumura, Okumura residence at Two Hancock Place. We'd like to express serious concerns about the impact that the proposed development of Two Hancock Place will have on our neighborhood. We remain adamant that the proposed addition and new driveway for Two Hancock Place will have a very negative aesthetic impact on our historic neighborhood. Most current the most current modifications of design do not alter the proposal to replace three magnificent hundreds of year old trees and a gracious lawn with a steep asphalt driveway and an over massive garage. Um, we have, uh, frankly, still in the village of Overton allowed the development proposal to go through with the permitting process as it is. The project appears to have been rushed through an approval during the corona outbreak, which concern given to the aqueduct, but no concern to our local street. 
those are written to the planning board. I've yet to post the minutes where the project was approved, and therefore we assert that you're within our rights to raise an objection to the final decision. We have also never been approached by the applicants, despite the fact that multiple parties have raised formal objections. Please don't approve this project. Thank you for attention to our concerns. Um, not really a uh, uh, board of trustees uh, matter. So we'll move on to the next one. Uh, the next one's from Tom Thacker. Uh, Dear Mayor and Board of Trustees, we write a support of the, multi the rezoning being contemplated for North Broadway Corridor, specifically as it relates to allowing for multifamily and attached single family residences. One of the few comforts we have taken during the pandemic is rediscovering a walk that takes us down South Buckhouse Street and along the brick path that meanders through the Half Moon Co-op complex. As we walk by this housing development, it is with, with its well-maintained grounds and residents of many races, ethnicities, and ages, we were reminded of the importance of the Half Moon Co-ops and a number of other apartment complexes in helping to maintain some of the economic and racial diversity of Irvington. While Half Moon certainly would not be defined as affordable by current standards of affordability, it does present a positive model of what multifamily middle income housing complex can be. Um, in closing, we, we would note that it's easy for communities across the county to look at Westchester County's 2019 affordable housing needs assessment and knowingly now their collective heads in agreement with the conclusions of the report, which among other things states that the total number of new affordable units needed in the county is 11,703. However, there's quite another thing to actually do something about it. Through rezoning, though, although rezoning does not ensure the creation of more affordable units in Irvington, it would allow this, it could be one of the possible outcomes. Maintaining single family zoning on these parcels would render these outcomes impossible. It's really Tom Thacker and Kate Carl, uh, 14 North Buckhouse Street, Irvington. Um, then we also have one from the Irvington Housing Committee. Uh, Following up on our earlier letter in support of the proposed rezoning of the North Broadway Corridor and recognizing that our earlier letter did not adequately address the full range of issues, the Irvington Housing Committee would like to offer the second letter to articulate more fully our collective positions in a number of areas. The Housing Committee remains steadfast in our support of the North Broadway Corridor rezoning proposal, especially those sections pertaining to multifamily housing, including rental apartments, condominiums, co-ops, and single-family attached developments and assisted living facilities. Committee support for these uses reflects our belief that the importance of a diverse housing stock in our village our recognition that there are precious few locations where these developments may still occur and our desire to minimize the environmental impact of new housing construction possible only through higher density cluster development. Additionally, it is our belief that such rezoning will allow Irvington to actively participate in solutions to the dire shortfall of affordable housing in the county as documented in the recently published Westchester County Housing Needs Assessment. The situation which impacts everyone in our community can only be changed by the kind of public resolve that we believe the Irvington government and community are capable of. The Housing Committee recognizes that the board may need to make compromises on the allowable uses currently contemplated in the rezoning plan. In our role as members of the Housing Committee, we have no stake in several of the proposed uses, including boutique hotels, restaurants, and office space. We do, however, strongly believe that one of the last opportunities for a village to create zoning that encourages and permits the development of housing that is more inclusive and affordably priced than much of the housing that has been created in Irvington in the recent past and strongly support the adoption of the housing components of the proposed rezoning of North Broadway Corridor Certainly, Peter Bernstein, Deborah Flock, Susan Robertson, Karen Schatzel, and Tom Thacker. Um, next up, uh, our concerned urban residents. As residents of Irvington, we applaud your efforts to rezone the area now designated as the North Broadway Mixed Use District. We write this letter because we are deeply troubled by the conclusions in the recent affordable housing needs assessment performed by the county that Irvington and many other Westchester communities did not have enough affordable housing for people of all income levels. The lack of reasonably priced housing impacts the diversity of our community by limiting the ability of low and middle income people, many of whose current income or those whose lack of generational wealth has been impacted by systemic racism to buy or rent at current market level prices. The lack of affordable housing has also led to a decrease in income diversity in our community, as many long term residents have had no choice but to sell their houses and leave the community due to tax increases resulting from the Greenberg reassessment. The other side strongly support the creation and preservation of housing units to meet the needs of the people at all income levels and support zoning changes to increase the density of any new housing. We also support the creation of an affordable housing fund and if the creation of affordably housed units in any assisted living facility constructed on one of these parcels is deemed impractical. Finally, we urge the board to be creative and proactive in looking for ways to pursue county, state, and federal funding and grants to create truly affordable housing. Thank you for your con con continuing commitment to the creation and preservation of fair and affordable housing in the village. Sincerely, um, it's signed by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Uh, I think it's, I think it was 44 people. Um, but a bunch of people, you can read them on the attachment. Um, next up is uh, from Tom Thacker also. 
Uh, I read with great interest that Briarcliff Manor has decided to end its residence only policy regarding access to its parks. Excerpt of the, the reasoning for doing so as follows. Our parks law hadn't been updated almost 30 years. Some of you may have known to ensure park money was benefiting the taxpayers who provided it, the old law was quite restrictive to deter outsiders from even stepping foot in our parks. We decided to be a bit more open. Our new law recognizes that residents and their guests should have first dibs and uh, on precious recreation facilities like tennis courts and baseball fields, but our parks should be open to all for strolling, for playground use, for enjoying the open air. Let people come here and see what great facilities our community has. That is actually better advertising to sustain po property values. Um, then that was a quote from uh, from the article or the excerpt. Uh, we have no idea why Briarcliff made the decision, but perhaps the recent national discussion about systemic racism and inclusion, exclusion and inclusion have played a major part. I know the answer to the question of how our specific park restrictions came about is probably unknowable, but it is not my wish to cast aspersions on the policymakers that made the decision or on those who wish to continue to keep those policies in place. However, it is abundantly clear that on a national level across the public facilities and systemic racism has been inextricably intertwined in our nation's history, as well as in public perception. Uh, then there's two op-ed pieces. I believe the village board should seize the moment to act as quickly and decisively as possible to lift the residence only restriction on our parks. This would make an important statement that the board has been listening to, that the board has been listening to, more importantly, decide to respond to one of the many national conversations we have had about systemic racism, specifically in this case, it relates to policies of inclusion and exclusion. Sincerely, Tom Thacker, 14 North Buckhouse Street. Um, and then I'm gonna actually skip down to Lori Regan's. Um, let's see here, here it is. Uh, I hope this, um, our last communication regarding the park, this is about Madison Park status and procedures. Our last communication regarding the park was just as COVID was beginning. And I'm wondering if there's any been any change since then or if your discussions are still on hold, it seems like common sense to me that in the middle of a global pandemic where people are must focus on socially distancing, the last thing in the world we should do is, is inviting non-residents into our parks, but common sense doesn't often prevail in the minds of the urban folks who eat, sleep, and breathe their progressive, obsessive social justice causes that they seek to impose on the rest of us. I would also argue that given the BLM looting, rioting, and other criminal activities running rampant across the country now, it certainly is not the time to invite non-residents in for fear of increased crime in our community. Again, common sense to me, but again, not ideologically brainwashed. Thanks for providing an update. Uh, that's from Lori Regan uh, from Riverview Road. Um, we actually, uh, the, the, the conversations are on hold, but not because of the reasons that Lori uh, mentions, but because we obviously have a, uh, a large uh, construction project going on. But when that's completed, we'll start the conversations again. Um, we also had 14 emails. Uh, 11 of them that made it in time to be included with uh, the uh, agenda and then three others that came after but had the same um, uh, topic which was um, uh, commemorating uh, and memorializing um, the enslaved Africans uh, that lived in the Irvington region historically um, but making sure that that commemoration happens on Main Street somewhere. Um, I will, I will actually, uh, we, Sarah Cox was the person that was reading, uh, leading that committee. Um, and Larry Schaffler um, actually responded after our last meeting. Um, some of the letter, it seemed to me that maybe the final message of our, of our, of our work session didn't get out to everyone that, that sent us emails. Um, so I'm just gonna read um, part of uh, Larry's letter in response to Sarah, um, at Sarah Cox, who was leading the, uh, the group um, in terms of moving forward with design, they suggested that they, meaning the Board of Trustees, suggested that the commemorating the Enslaved Africans Committee initiate a design proposal. The Board of Trustees would have some early input on the design, and ultimately they could be responsible for approving the final design. I can assist you with convening a meeting to help you get that initial design input. The village also has plans to install two wayfinding kiosks on Main Street, one near the, the O'Hara, uh, no, the uh, OCA, the uh, Aqueduct Trail, um, and the other near the train station. Your committee and other interested individuals will be invited to review the wording of the signage and the board of trustees will be responsible for approving the final wording. The wording, lastly, while the board considered the request to place a commemorating statue near Village Hall, they ultimately rejected the idea. However, they left open the possibility of locating commemorating somewhere on Main Street. The nature and size of the commemoration is still to be determined. I urge the board to hold off with any location scouting until at least the fall and the significant construction on Main Street will be completed. But after that, I would fully expect to bring together interested individuals, including your, some of your committee, to discuss the possibility of commemoration on Main Street. 
Um, I did leave off the first big important part. Um, the Board of Trustees discussed the proposal of commemoration of enslaved Africans at their work session on Wednesday night. At that meeting, they offered to collaborate on design of a village-owned property along South Buckhouse Street along Barney Brook. They encouraged that space to be designed as a space for contemplation and remembrance of the enslaved of African ancestry who lived and died there. Uh, we also outlined the idea that the space could be designed to include a sitting area, serve as a gathering space for small group educational experiences for both school children and adults, and include ways to provide information to those who visit the place. So I think the, um, the big takeaway, which is also uh, Sarah Cox has responded today that, you know, her group will probably uh, reconvene after um, after uh, Labor Day, which is you know good timing with hopefully our projects are, are wrapping up on Main Street by then, um, and then we can we can um, you know start the conversations again. But uh, you know to me it was it was pretty clear that you know at the end of the uh, of the work session that you know we were open to doing something on Main Street. It just you know the the, the board uh, had a consensus that it shouldn't be in front of um, Village Hall, uh, that no commemoration should be in front of Village Hall but that uh, we were very open to other places on Main Street. So um, it was a lot of correspondence. I don't know if anyone else wants to say anything, but to me, it's pretty straightforward that we, uh, we are happy to move forward and, and, and you know, talk and, and continue to work with the, uh, the committee and getting something uh, that we can all be proud of uh, in the Main Street area, as well as on South Buckhouse Street. So I just said one point, sure. because a lot of the letters we're referring to doing something like a, a commemorative plaque and a bar relief um, in front of uh, Main Street School. And the only thing I think I wanted to make sure everyone realized was that's that wall is not under village uh, control or management, right? It's they would have to, like the Rip Van Winkle, they would have to uh, go through the school district to work out those details. Um, right, although right. I personally think it's a great location. Um, anyways, I just don't think we have much say so in that beyond that. Correct. No, I just wanted to also comment that you know, I was a little dis uh, disappointed with the with a number of the letters and how they sort of denigrated the the concept of a contemplative area uh, down by Buckout Street and Station Road. I think part of the reason that they did so was they might have been implying that that was the only location. Um, and I think we made it clear that that won't be. But I think that that location can be an excellent site. I really disagree with a lot of the comments that it's hidden away. Um, I think it can become an integral part of any walking tour of the village. Um, it, could, it can certainly be a lovely contemplative area. Uh, and I was disappointed to read a lot of the letters that, that were so denigrated in terms of location and the idea. Yeah, and I mean, I think, I don't know if we mentioned it specifically for people who are just kind of tuning into this issue, but that's where uh, we believe that there is actually the burial ground. So it's not a random place we selected. It's a very, it's, it's, it's a potentially sacred place that, you know, makes a lot of sense. Um, then you add on top of it that there is a kind of a babbling brook there as well. And, and I think we can have a, a wonderful, um, you know, uh, you know, commemoration and, and appropriate, you know, like not, not just somber, but, you know, uh, you know, a, a, an educational jumping off point as well, which I think would be, you know, so important. So, um, but, you know, to me, they're, they're, they're two parts of the same project and, you know, we're happy to, to uh, pursue both of them. So, but that's, uh, that's it for uh, correspondence. If anybody wants to read the letters, they are all, they all are attached, except for the three that came in late uh, that we will post at the next meeting. That was, the, the late ones were from uh, Peter Bernstein, Lisa again, and Sarah Cox. Uh, but Sarah's letter basically said, we look forward to working with you uh, after Labor Day, so. Um, but uh, that being said, I will uh, open it up for public comment if anyone wants to uh, raise their hand and uh, talk about anything that's not in the, yeah, I guess any, I see anything. Um, I don't think we, have, we don't have a public hearing tonight. So any uh, any items you want to talk about are uh, fair game. Okay, so one person, um, K, K. O'Keefe has hand up, hold on. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. loud and clear. Yes. Okay, great. I'm going to read Peter Bernstein's letter to you. Um, he wasn't able to do this tonight. And his letter expresses my feelings also. 
Dear Mayor Smith and trustees, I am so disappointed by our collective failure to undo the legacies of systemic racism. We failed at integration and closing the racial wealth gap. Our failure is due to us not facing up to the true history of our country and not taking adequate steps to truly remediate the damages done. After the Holocaust, Germany engaged in a truth and reconciliation process. South Africa did the same after the end of apartheid. We have not been willing to face up to our history in a meaningful way. Until Sarah and Kathy presented the history of enslaved Africans in this area, Irvington was comfortable in ignoring that part of our history. Irvington was founded in 1872 and the Irvington Historical Society was founded in 1972. So we have 248 years and 48 years of historical omission. We are, of course, not alone in this. Phillipsburg Manor ignored its true history for its first 50 years as a historical site. Initially telling the story of wealthy Dutch settlers, even though none had ever lived on the site, then adding the stories of the tenant farmers. It was only about 30 years ago that historic Hudson Valley began presenting the actual full story of what took place in our area. Did you know that in addition to being enslavers, our tenant farmers, our tenant farming founders, main cash crop went to the Caribbean to feed the enslaved sugar plantation population. Why was this history ignored for so long? The most forgiving response might be that since there were no or not many black residents in the area, their history was, un was not important. The more important questions today are, why were, are there so few black residents in Irvington and other desirable areas? How did that come to be? And what can we do as a community and country to face up to the legacies of systemic racism? Having a historical commemoration of the enslaved Africans whose labor built the wealth of our founding tenant farmers on Main Street is a small but meaningful request of our community. Hiding our recognition of slavery in our area by placing it in the corner where few will see it while keeping the honorific Main Street area street names of enslavers is unacceptable. We visited the Forster AME Zion Church in Tarrytown this weekend. It was a stop on the Underground Railroad and remains an important center of the black community in our area. The pastor, Reverend Andre Upson, told me that he has visited Irvington just one time. How wonderful it would be to have Reverend Upson and his congregation see a prominent Main Street commemoration of our earliest black residents. Sincerely, Peter Bernstein. Okay, thank you. Yes, that's it. Anybody else, Larry? Uh, uh, hold on. Uh, one more person uh, listed as uh, James. Yeah. Okay, James. James. Uh, good hey, Larry. Uh, Brian, uh, Board of Trustees, this is James Raby. Um, I have a question just regarding the North Broadway um, rezoning proposal. And if, if this is something you're going to pick up later on, obviously you can pick it up then. But my, my key question is having a look at the amendments is trying to understand why there seems to be a change to the setbacks, the required setbacks with regards to the properties. Um, particularly the side and rear setbacks where I think it's being reduced down to 50 feet if it's um, not abridging or budding a, a single family district. Recognising I, I live on Strawberry Lane and obviously one of our biggest concerns is the size of these developments and how it's going to impact the local environment. Obviously any changes to the setbacks is somewhat concerning. Sure. Um, that was something we talked about at one of the recent work sessions. 
that we didn't think, I think it was originally going to be 75 on some of them. We, when we looked at Strawberry Lane was the one we spent most of our time looking at that we felt that with the road and then the 50 foot setback that we thought that that was probably enough. Um, I think what, what is also going to probably, I, I think the, the reason that nothing else, there wasn't too many other changes in the draft that's, that's, you know, around today is there are potential for um, additional changes. Um, and I'm actually glad you're here. Um, you know, I, I, one of the questions I have for yourself, who, who is obviously, you know, living this and, and right in the, the zone, um, are the uses that, you know, that you, you know, we, we haven't had a lot of specific complaints about many of the uses, but, you know, one of the things we talked about last meeting was, um, you know, we, one of the things I wanted to do um, was limit the uses really to multifamily um, and potentially single family attached, which, you know, it's kind of, we kind of went back and forth on, but getting rid of many of the other uses other than the kind of what's there now. So for me, it would be the office, the current office use, um, the religious and school uses, which we couldn't eliminate if we wanted to, uh, and then multifamily. Um, and I, and, you know, we haven't heard any feedback from anybody on that yet. You're kind of the first one up that we, that we've had access to. And I was just wondering what, what a, a proposal like that would be like as opposed to what's currently on the table? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, listen, I, I, it's sort of interesting. We, we've, uh, we've had a group of us who I guess we've <laughs> deemed at times a coalition of the willing, but one of the things which we talked about months and months ago as we started engaging with you on this proposal and coming back to our first letter was an incredibly strong preference to maintain this area as residential. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons. Um, so I think if, if, if the Board of Trustees are really focused on how can we make good use of that space, but use it through multifamily uses, um, and that would mean uh, less large scale commercial development and use, I would strongly support that, strongly, strongly support that. There's something which I think would be something I can certainly speak for myself, I can speak for my wife, but I imagine for a number of people who've been concerned about this, that would be uh, a, a great outcome. Great, that's super helpful. Um, yeah, because we, we were kind of, we felt like we were a little bit talking into a, uh, an echo chamber of just the, uh, the five of us and, and then Marianne and, and Larry. So, you know, um, you, 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 obviously your family was one of the ones, first ones I thought of to kind of get your input. Um, so. Yes. I didn't know I didn't know which James it was, but I'm glad it was you. <laughs> Brian, <laughs> can I ask that, James a question? Please do. <laughs> Brian? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Can I ask James? James, um if I the law the way it's written would the, the setbacks would not affect your property. Yep, I understand. Okay. Uh, okay. So and and, and I, I, so I was, it would stay the same from your property. Yes. And I guess the thinking was the properties across the street, besides the 50 feet, have the 25 feet of the street. So that yeah, it would be that and, and that, I, that would that was the thinking on changing, switching the number like that. Yeah, Marion, I, I appreciate that. And and my reaction, I, I guess, is obviously. You know, we're pretty close to our neighbours, so we're concerned about their impact. They're, they're a little closer to the property. I, I, and I'll be incredibly transparent. If you understand the plots of land, our building and our, and our house is actually quite very close to Strawberry Lane. So the setback from 75 feet would have much, much less impact on our property where it sits, our actual house, oh, I see. versus... 50 is getting much much closer to our house so we were more comfortable with 75 because it gave us some breathing room down in front of our property but that's our major concern with it okay great well we you know we uh we are still gonna have to have another draft when we, we actually talked tonight about what we want to do with the uses um that's uh that's the chunk of tonight's meeting um is, is discussing that i think because we we talked about them a lot last Wednesday, but you know we didn't come to any conclusions, didn't take any straw polls. So, don't know if we're all ready tonight, but you know maybe we are. Okay, so um, it sounds like we're getting into the North Broadway discussion, which is fine. Um, I don't 
uh, there's two other hands that are raised and I'm going to guess that they're both relating to North Broadway. So, yeah. um, so I don't know if you want to roll right into that, which we kind of, <laughs> we, we kind of did already. I think that's fine. I mean, does anyone have any questions on the consent agenda before we get back to it? Otherwise I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda. I did have one question about it. I was a little concerned. There seemed to be a lot of, um, what's the right word? Uh, there's a lot of give back in terms of the amount of, I guess it was contingency that was built into things like every project in the water department, but um, where a lot of them had, you know, 30 to $50,000 or so. I don't remember the exact numbers give back, but the total going back into debt service and contingency was over 400,000. So I'm wondering what we're doing that's causing us to get, I mean, is it all contingency that, that didn't have to be utilized or what? I, I think that, that's the new, that's the close out of certain capital projects, that one you're talking about? Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, didn't, I didn't realize that was gonna be part of, uh, I thought that was gonna be a separate it, item not in the consent agenda. It, I said, yeah, it, it should actually be added as a separate agenda item. Yeah, yeah so I, I was gonna add those through uh, 13A and 13B, Mark, if you wanna save those. So this is just the minutes, the part-time personnel in the rec department and the rate change for permanent part-time positions in the Department of Public Works. No problem. Okay, so I'll make a motion if I can have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Sorry about that. I should have, I should have clarified that. But now we can get back to it, Larry. No, oh, well, you're, it's your show. <laughs> Such as it is. <laughs> Who's next? So North Broadway. Yeah, exactly. But, but, but we we'll continue the public comment because you know people want to talk about it before we uh, we talk about it. That's fine. I, I think it would be helpful to to, to kind of uh, go back and and just you know pick up where you left off in the work session, uh, okay. which which involved uh, kind of going through. You spent a lot of time talking about different uses. Um, you know, we can kind of summarize where that left off and, and hear any any comments that there might be about the uses that you discussed at the work session. That was the, the main goal for tonight. Yeah, and if I might suggest, maybe it's worth um, going through the changes since the last draft. There, most of them aren't very, are, you know, aren't too significant, but I think a, a couple of them we should uh, talk about, like the density factor and stuff. So. Do you want me to do that, Brian? Yeah, that'd be, that'd be helpful. Why don't we review that first, and then we'll pick up the comp. We'll, we'll definitely allow. We see both of you with your hands up, so we'll uh, we'll let, we'll make sure you get to uh, talk. Okay. So I'm just gonna whoever looked at it on um, online, the the the, new, the changes were highlighted. James Raby just mentioned one of them was that um, right. We changed the, the board changed the minimum um, required yards in the side and rear from from 70. It was it was 50. They changed it to 75. Now it's back to 50, but 75 if abutting a one family district. And um, it clarifies that two properties do not abut if there's a street between them. I talked a little bit about that before when I was talking to James. Um, it also clarifies that if there's full service restaurants, there can't be drive-through facilities. Um, there's a, we fixed up the, the, the definition of coverage. That's a technical thing. Um, there were um, a bunch of um, uh, provisions put in about signs, any signs that might be connected. And um, uh, I don't, it, it's 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 not it's not a lot different from the other sign code. In short, there should be one sign for each permitted use. The maximum surface of any permitted sign can't be bigger than 12 square feet per side. Um, it says that a sign can be freestanding um, and could be located within the 50 foot Broadway buffer. The reason that's in there is the law otherwise says there can't be any structures in the Broadway buffer, but it doesn't make sense not to allow a sign closer to the street. So it said there could be in the Broadway buffer, but no sign shall exceed 10 feet in height. Remember that any sign would have to be approved by the ARB. 
Um, interior lit signs aren't permitted, only direct, indirectly um, illuminated signs. There can't be, same as throughout the village, any flashing, moving, fluttering lights. Um, and then no sign can, can um, be put on an existing stone wall. Um, it gives standards to the ARB for reviewing it. And then, and then this, I think, is the most significant change. Um, the board wanted to um, encourage affordable housing and, um, and not, not necessarily affordable housing that meets the county's definitions, but just housing that would be affordable to somebody maybe just starting out, you know, start, starting out in, in, in pr whatever practice they're in. And um, the, the density factor, let me explain what density factor is. Density factor is um, you, you, you take the size of the property, the, the size of the property after you've made all deductions and stuff, and then you divide it by a certain number. So if they're um, single family houses, it might be 10,000, 20,000, 40,000, depending on what district you're in. And um, the code now for multifamily, the density factor is 5,000. In fact, most of the multifamily in the village is way below 5,000. It's somewhere between 2,500 and 3,500. Um, that, that provision was written after most of the multifamily projects in the village were built. So this reduces it to 3,500. Now, um, I, I, I think it's important for people to realize what, what that translates into a number of units. Larry, do you have the, the chart I... Larry, you're, you're on mute. No, Larry, you're on mute. I know, I'm trying to pull it up, sorry. I'll pull it up oh, just okay. a second. The, the, the chart Larry, Larry's figuring out would tell you for each of the each of the properties in this district, how many? Um, uh, what's the maximum number of of of, of apartments um, or dwelling units there could be on the on that property? That that's the cap. That doesn't necessarily mean that um, uh, they can build that many um, because who the developer has to meet the setback requirements, they have to meet the height requirements, they have to meet the coverage requirements, but whatever building they have that meets those requirements, this would be the maximum number of units they could put in. Um, and that's capped at 100. Well, there is a cap at, at 100 that's relevant to only a couple of the properties. Okay, so, um, on the max on property, now we're working with net buildable site area. Now a net buildable site area is, is the overall area of the site minus the resource protection features. <clears throat> if there's steep, if there's steep slopes, a certain percentage of them, if there's any wetland, whatever you subtract it, then you've got your net buildable site area. So the Maxon property has a net buildable site area of 170,000 square feet with a density factor of 5,000, which was original in the last draft, they could have a, 34, a maximum of 34 uh, rental dwelling units. And with a density factor of 3,500, they could have 48. The Carafiello property, it's not a lot different 35 and 49, you might wonder why, because their property is quite a bit bigger, but a lot of the, the square footage of their property is subtracted because it's got steep slopes. So their net buildable site area is 174,000. Um, on the Irvington Equities property, which is the one that's just south of the, um, uh, of the multifamily building there, they could have uh, uh, with a, a, a with a density factor of 5,009 units with 3,512 units on the small Holy Spirit Association property, which is just south of that. They could have eight or 11. And then the whole, both the Holy Spirit Association property and the Ebbett House property are huge um, with a density factor of uh, 80, 
whoops, I see, I made, I made a mistake on this thing. Um, they could have 88 units with 5,000 or 126 with the density factor of 3,500. But elsewhere in the code, it says you can have multifamily, but not more than 100 units. So actually on this Holy Spirit Association, this should be 100 with 126 in parentheses. And on Abbott House, um, they're, all, they're also capped at 100. So um, the, only, the only thing that should be different on this, this 126 should be 100. Uh, so anyway, um, and that's it. The other thing on this latest draft in section seven, um, it didn't, it, I forgot to change the 5,000 to 3,500. So anyway, was that, was that clear to everybody? Yes, thank you. Okay. I'm done. Great. Well, you know, um, the, the main thrust of my, uh, what, what I talked about it last time was streamlining uses to, you know, I, you know, Larry had met, reminded us of a, of a meeting we had with the Brightview football, not Brightview, with the Carafiello uh, team uh, before they sold it. Um, and I think they had six potential buyers come in. Uh, four of them were were potential multifamily housing units, and two of them were assisted living facilities. Um, they asked all five board members at the time, and I think three of us were on the board then, um, what we wanted, and we all said multifamily right across the uh, the board, knowing that they also add some affordable, and you know, multifamily is typically more affordable by definition because there's more units. And you know, one of the, the letter from Tom Thacker about, about uh, you know how great our co-ops are in town. Um, that really got me thinking that if we give them other options, uh, you know, they people will likely take us up on them. And this is kind of our last best chance to really have, uh, you know, multifamily that would add not only affordable in the, you know, definitional sense of it, but, you know, kind of more affordable units in town uh, along the lines of the co-op stock that we have. Um, so that was kind of what I've been reflecting on, you know, in the last several months is, you know, do we have to take out the other um, potential uses? And in my opinion, yes, was the answer. I, I came to a, a pretty firm yes, um, not only boutique hotels and restaurants, but also uh, for me, um, assisted living, because to me, we had lived through the exact situation of us saying, hey, we, we really like multifamily, we really like multifamily. And they said, great, we want to do assisted living because we think we can make more money on it. Um, so, you know, to me, to add assisted living as of right, uh, I think we'll, we'll eventually get some kind of assisted living in that area. And to me, it's not um, necessarily the, uh, my, my best use for that, that property right now. Um, I do feel that, you know, kind of looking in, at the region, um, the, the river towns or, you know, kind of central Westchester, cent south central Westchester, I feel like they are being overbuilt now. I don't think Brightview and Tarrytown is close to full um, I don't think the one in Ardsley is close to full. So I don't think there's a dire need for it. Um, and if you have to leave Irvington proper to go to Tarrytown or go to Ardsley or Dobbs Ferry or something, to me, that's not a, a, a travesty. It's worse to me when people say, I want to move, I want to stay here when I, you know, get older and downsize my house, or I want to be able to move here after I graduate from college and they're unable to talking to my friends in the volunteer fire department, talking to my friends in the police department or teachers that don't really have that much stock uh, available. So to me, um, I do think it's fair to allow them to use the uses that they've been using, which are office space. Um, I don't particularly think that there'll be a lot more of office space development, but you know, they can continue to use them uh, you know, as of right, in my opinion now, um, you know, and maybe a slightly expanded, expanded definition, including the, the R&D, and I think there was one other like, small medical office use or something that we proposed, but that would be that. And then the religious and school use, which we can't actually, you know, eliminate if we wanted to, and it's already allowed. Um, so to me, it would, that would be it. Those would be the only uses uh, for, for the zone um, if I had my drillers. So uh, I'll lead off with that. And uh, I will let anyone else who wants to speak next, uh, speak next. Just remember to unmute yourself and I'll mute myself. I guess it's a chicken game. So I'll just gonna 
break in that I'm essentially, I don't have a problem with uh, Brian's analysis. I would probably go for it if, if uh, everyone else concurred in terms of eliminate some of the other uses. Um, I had thought there were a couple specific uh, properties such as the one near 120 North Broadway, which could actually make sense as a bed and breakfast or a restaurant, but you know, I'm, I'm more than willing to um, compromise on that. The one area that I'm the most concerned about is the inclusion of single family home attached at the current proposed density factor of 3,500. I just do not see that that makes any sense whatsoever, um, especially considering that uh, previous um, single family houses were under, uh, when it was an M a 1F20, were under a 20,000 factor, density factor. So I think the number for, if we include single family attached, it has to go up significantly. Otherwise we're gonna have extremely dense McMansions um, and really um, no access, uh, no accessible with affordable, uh, I mean, with the lower A or the big A, um, not enough of that. So the only way that we're really gonna get a lot of uh, affordable housing in any kind of stock is to go with multifamily and eliminate the, um, the single family attached or significantly increase its density factor to where it's better in balance with what those structures are really about. And that's, been, that's my current argument. Okay, anybody else? Well, Mark, I understand that argument. Um, the but there though is then we have less housing and we lose the opportunity to increase diversity and increase stability of, of uh, you know, an increased population. So, um, you know, given that argument, I think, I think I would argue to remove all single family and to really try to, uh, to encourage multifamily. I think that's where you were going, but I'm just uh, voicing that. That's what I was saying. I was saying if though single family attached was left in, you would have to have a much higher density factor. But at this point, I would just think that multifamily serves our needs much better. I'd be willing to get rid of uh, single family attached and just have multifamily. Uh, it it, it some, some ways makes it cleaner. And it, it, a lot of the debates we're having about, you know, massing and sizing and spacing and things like that, that, you know, I think we'd probably have to do a lot more work on um, or also then <laughs> omitted from our discussions. So. I would also support, strongly support multifamily as the, the, the main focus of that, of the development there. I think that speaks to the needs as has been articulated so far of our community. It also very directly responds to um, the concerns raised by the people who want to make sure that we deal with some of the issues of diversity and inclusion in this community. This is one very real way we can do it that will actually, you know, hopefully affect people who are able to live here. The only comment I would make, and I'm not witted to any of this, but I think we should leave as many of the other uses as possible, excluding the big ones like um, assisted living and um, boutique hotels. But we have a couple of small properties and there's probably not en enough to make it worth their while to make the multifamily. So clubs and conference centers, you know, just a range of bed and breakfast, a range of other uses that might be more appealing to some of those smaller properties that perhaps are not suitable for multifamily. Okay. Um... Well, I think it's been eloquently said about the need for multifamily and I am, am totally in agreement with that. And I also like the comments during the work session when we talked about how with um, being close to public transportation, we might not have as much of a traffic issue as we might otherwise have with as many um, units as there would be with um, multifamily, but it, you know, if you started adding up the numbers of possible new places for people to live when we looked at that chart, that was, you know, very exciting to see that. Um, I do though have, um, right now I'm not 
I'm not in favor of, um, maybe I'm the only, the only voice to say this, but I would not be in favor of removing assisted living. Uh, I understand the argument about there's a lot of uh, buildup in the area right now. Um, and that I thought about that, but I also, I also thought about as a business person, I wouldn't come here and propose such a development if I thought the area was so full that it would be a financial failure. So sometimes the market forces say there won't be such a proposal. Um, and I also thought that um, although it's not a loud group of people here, I, I do believe from you know the last couple of years that people have, have often expressed that that would be what would be a use for older people who do who don't who don't make the the, the leap. In fact, I, I know a man who used to live on Jaffrey who is in Brightview in Terrytown, and he said, you know, I wanted to be in Irvington. Um, so having an assisted living place, which I do see is still supported by the housing um, group, which um, makes me feel good too, that that would be as long as it is actually constrained in the way that we think is appropriate. That's why we've spent a lot of time and maybe there are even greater constraints that no developer would, able, would be able to come in and say, but wait, we want it bigger. No, here is what the zoning says. We don't need to discuss it. These are the constraints. You can make a proposal that fits or it doesn't. Um, it, can't, um, it can't be a drain or ambulance. You can't find your own way of having an ambulance. You can't do it. All the things that we've discussed for, I guess, months now with this. Um, so I don't think it would be the same kind of bright view or continuum discussion that I, I, I sympathize as, that just as with Brian that, you know, to, to, to do that again would be just uh, torture, absolute torture. But I, I don't think we need to, um, I don't know what I would say, fall for it. You say these are the constraints, um, take it or leave it. You know, that's what it is. We're, 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 we're not changing that. Um, I know Brian brought up an idea that I, I thought about too, where we could say, okay, you can come in and make a proposal. It's not in our zoning, but we could um, make a change based on something that seemed like a really good proposal. But that seems more like the old way, whereas the intention was to have something determined ahead of time that these are the constraints and rather than respond to a particular um, developer. So, um, I mean, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot, but right now I would still be in favor of leaving that in. Um, I mean, I don't mind getting rid of conference centers or, or some of those things, but as, as Mark said, some of those smaller places I think could, could take some of those other uses. And obviously um, the current use would need to stay in. Um, I agree, you know, given all the all the constraints and problems with attached single family, I would say cross that out. Um, I don't know if I left any other ones out. I was looking for all my notes on that, but those are my current thinking. Um, I certainly um, appreciate and learn from people's input on this and um, that's where I am right now. I have a question of, do we, if, if, the, if we proceed with, um, encouraging and really limiting the uses to almost exclusively multifamily. Do we have a sense of um, capacity in terms of the school? Um, and Marion, I had raised this question. I know that every specific proposal would have to analyze that, but are there some general, and it may be difficult to guess because- You know, they do have these general formulas, but I don't think it makes any sense to use general formulas um, because it's going to be a lot of people, maybe people are more likely to move to Irvington because they like the schools. So it seemed to me the best way to do it was to get a read on how many, um, how many students are generated from the multifamily prod, um, developments in the village now. Oh, and I was hoping they would have those numbers, but Larry talked to, Larry talked to, um, to, uh, to Chris Harrison and apparently they don't, they don't have them broken down that way. Um, am I right, Larry? That's correct, yeah. Um, but they, 
Uh, they they did say, and I'm just trying to call, call up the uh, the note that I sent around. Um, they did say that they're at, they they are um, at capacity at some of their lower grade levels, not as much on the high school level, but um, in the lower grade levels, uh, middle school on down. So um, it wasn't a although the the population was projected to come down by some of their forecasts, they actually bucked that trend and stayed about flat over those years where they were expected to come down. So they're not exactly, um, you know, uh, home free in terms of capacity, especially, I mean, there are, there's certain grade levels here and there, of course, they're, they're okay, but uh, not across the board. The one thing, Janice, I can't say, I mean, I can't give real numbers, but generally there are fewer, I mean, it's sort of obvious, fewer students generated by multifamily housing. Um, I, I know that was the case when we had uh, developments in, in, in Hastings um, and uh, uh, one other place I worked. But anyway, they, they, they tend not, well, it's clearly not as much as in single family, but I mean, I, I, think, I, think, those, I think those numbers are important, um, but I don't, I, I don't know if you want to make more of an effort to get those numbers before you decide to limit it to multifamily. I just don't want us to be in a position of unintended consequences. You know, I, we are all- All right, well, you know what? Let, let, let me see what I can find out. Maybe if I, if I call um, Ashley, she'll, she'll, they'll have some planning helpful. factor they that can do. So let's start not out of nowhere. Of course, we're, we're talking about potentially over 300 units. And um, I don't think any of us want to be in a position of saying, oh, great, we just added 900 kids to the school system, you know. Well, I mean, no, it's not. Of course not. But, but it yeah. depends also on how many bedrooms and so on. But it would be helpful, I think, to have a ballpark. Now, understanding that it can't be definite and that each project, each proposal will have to have its own numbers, its own projections. But I think it would yeah, be. Yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. Yeah, you also want to come up with zoning that's realistic because if the first one comes in and they've taken up all the the the, the, the school the school slots and then and the traffic thing, then what's a realistic development for the other properties? Well, exactly, and that's that's exactly the next question. If if we say all of these lots multifamily is desired, and the first one comes in, that pretty well takes it to the end of what's the traffic in school, then what happens to the other large properties if we if we narrow the uses so well yeah I mean yes that's definitely an issue. Yeah that yeah, was, was a little bit of my I'm sorry that was a little bit of my thinking too that um, that I know the example that that Brian has where the the assisted living pushed out multifamily. Does that mean that, that that is absolutely what would happen now? I don't know how many years ago that was. I mean, market forces change and needs change. I, I, I don't know that that's absolutely what would happen this time. Um, and then, like you said, there's, there's a use on one and then there's a use on another. So I've, I've, these are the things that have been swirling around in my head as I've been thinking about um, those uses. And I, I think more information about the schools would be pretty relevant. Um, so anyway, that's some, some of my thinking. So I'm not understanding why we couldn't synthesize the information. Um, if the school has the address of the uh, student, it would be a matter of, I mean, whether or not we got a hold of the address, we don't care, but we know what addresses are associated with what multifamily developments. I mean, that's a matter of record. So, you know, the post office knows that. So it seems to me that someone with that information in an Excel spreadsheet could get numbers like within about 20 minutes, <laughs> you know, most. Yeah, but I mean, what are you gonna do? Ask the school district to do it? I mean, that's the issue. Hmm. You, don't, you don't have the information and the only the school does and then I mean, it doesn't seem to me it's a big deal either, but you're, at, you're asking them to do it. I mean, I'm sure they got a lot of things on their plate now. Could I ask, um, I, think, I, I think I know the answer, but 
you know, with our with our affordable housing law, um, big A, as per the county, um, that applies to multifamily, even yes. though they are small A. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So if you have a building with, you know, 50 units in it, five of them have to be affordable or maybe more depending on the size. Right. If they're smaller, then you need to have more. You have to have the equivalent, 80% of the square footage. Okay. So this this really gives us both big A and small A affordable, multifamily zoning. Well, I would just like to add um, the housing committee's letter, which was written prior to our work session. Um, I know that they are in, in discussion now about whether that they want to revise that letter, whether it would include um, assisted living or not. Uh, and I know that one of their recommendations would be to increase the amount of set aside for big A affordable housing um, in those situations. So I'm sorry, to what? To increase the, uh, the set aside amount, the percentage amount of big A affordable housing. Um, for multifamily, one of the things go, that they're talking about now. So it would go for multifamily, it would go above uh, one for every 10. It would go some other factor like 1.5 or two for every 10. I don't know what the factor is, but that way you would effectively increase the capital A affordable. Well, well if I, I might make is something else you might want to think about is r rather than making a higher percentage um, for multifamily would be to give a bonus. A, de a density bonus for multifamily, so that you might want to think about that. So if, if you're up to 49 units, you could actually have, you know, 52 if you made X number affordable, mm -hmm. that, which is another way to do it. I, yes, this brings up another question of mine, if these discussions are really helpful. Um, do we know anything about in Westchester, in our area, multifamily units that have been built and what what are the actual costs of newly built? Um, you know, what is the rent? <laughs> how, 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 how small a affordable could we expect them to be in a, in a I, have, I have no idea, obviously less than a single family house, but is it still, would it still be within the range of, you know, a, a teacher and a, and a nonprofit, uh, you know, person who works. At, and so I, I don't know, I mean, I'd like to know that we would be achieving our goal by doing this. Um, so but aren't they also able to be not, there to be rental units as well, depending on yeah, how, but, the, how it's <laughs> organized. It doesn't have to all be for sale. No, yeah, I, I was thinking that too, but I, I don't know what has been built in our in our general region recently, um, and what what are the rental costs for new units like that? Uh, thanks. <laughs> uh, oh, the other I had another thing. Is there also? I mean, I I hope that we don't abandon our bonuses for protection of historic um, structures on these properties. And, and everything else that we've worked pretty hard to do, I'm assuming we don't want to start all over again on that. No, the, the, those were coverage in FAR, so that, that really, they, they don't intersect with the dentist density factor or the uses. All right, not, okay, that's, that's good to know. <laughs> oh, so Come what on. happens in this case, though? Let's say we have the very first um, proposal is for a large multifamily development. We love it. it. It accomplishes our goals in terms of affordable housing. Sure. And when we do the analysis in terms of traffic and school capacity and whatever, it means that another development of that size on another property is not going to fit. Is not going to to. We're not going to be able to permit it because it really they can't they can't meet the traffic standards. So then what? So if we've eliminated all uses other than- Exactly. That, that was the issue I raised to you at the, at the work session. Um, 
not not thinking so much about the schools. I certainly didn't realize the schools were capacity capacity because I know a lot of schools aren't, but but certainly certainly for traffic, yeah, there's something to bear in mind. I you should know that when um, when they do the traffic analysis, um, you have to also calculate in the traffic um, that would be generated by any other project that's on the horizon. But they may not be on the horizon yet, so then it's not going to be factored in. And then is the baseline what exists, let's say, um, in 2022, one property is developed as multifamily, and then two years later, another developer wants to do multifamily. Is the traffic um, effect based on what is now the base rather it would be the no it would be whatever it is currently and then they they put in they they, they i forget what the, they put in a factor a certain growth factor in any event but yeah if you had a project come in in 2021 and then in 2023 the 2023 one wouldn't use the 2021 they would you you, you have you what they do when they do a traffic study is they have to go out and, and me, you identify the intersections you want the traffic measured at, and they have to go out and measure it. Right. So and it would be as of the date that one is being reviewed. Okay. Did that answer you kind yeah, of? Yes, yeah. I'm just, I'm just trying to think, is it, if, if people say, oh, now the traffic is worse, is it now? Yeah, well, that gets taken into again. account, sure. Yeah. You take it as you find it. Yeah, right. So if there's nothing else uh, from the board standpoint, I think one of the goals was to uh, to hear some feedback on your thoughts about um, the the types of uses, right, Brian? Correct. So if that's if that's the case, um, you do have two people with their hands up. Uh, first, I'm going to assume is Taylor Palmer. So uh, is that Taylor? That is indeed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There you go. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, Larry. Thank you, members of the board. Uh, it's good to see all of you, although you can't see me. I am wearing a purple tie, just for the record. Um, tonight, I am joined by our clients, uh, Hannah Rubin and her brother, David Rubenzahl. As you know, they're the owners of the Maxon property. We did have the opportunity to attend uh, the Village's work session last week. And I mean, we were certainly surprised and actually disappointed to hear some of the comments um, about some of the uses being uh, discussed at that meeting, namely, of course, uh, the assisted living facilities. We just wanted to make a few quick points tonight. We know it's not a public hearing, so we do appreciate the chance to speak, we did uh, raise our hand the last meeting. So again, we're, we're, we're glad we get to make these comments tonight. Um, as you know, our clients have been participating since day one on this. And I know you all have really worked hard to put this uh, into motion, you know, in furtherance of the comprehensive plan committee's uh, recommendations. And our participation, and I mean our Maxon's participation in this as one of the six property owners was requested by the board. So we're certainly not Maxon's fault that others haven't really participated more. Um, but, you know, again, Maxon brought its consultants on really to help in this review process. Uh, and show how the properties can be meaningly, meaningfully or viably uh, developed. We're gonna ask these same planning consultants to provide further comment, uh, but of course it was a little short turnaround from the work session today. So we, we will be submitting those for your benefit uh, and the benefit of the board and the public with respect to um, comments from tonight and from the work session. But from our initial discussions with those consultants, you know, we would confirm that limiting these properties to fewer uses doesn't mean that you're going to have all multifamily or all assisted living. Uh, instead, a mix of uses is possible and really what was you know, contemplated in the comprehensive plan. As Deputy Mayor Kehoe rightly said, the market is going to drive these uses. It's not quite if you build it, or I guess in this case, propose it, it will come. Um, at the end of the day, they're considered uses that are consistent with the comprehensive plan update. And these all support rateable uses uh, that are viable rather than losing these properties to not-for-profit uh, uses and pull them off the tax rolls. As the board has been reviewing for the last year, and it was mentioned by a few members this evening, the existing law has significant controls. I mean, that's what's been reviewed for, for months, you know, down to the you know very, very specific screening requirements, setbacks, uh, density restrictions, FAR. I mean, this this law is, and you know, to drive up Strawberry Lane, it's, it's all very heavily uh, regulated. And again, um, as the, the mayor mentioned the last meeting or, or Marianne pointed out, this uses such as assisted living are by special permits. So while they are they are permitted in the code, they have to meet all these standards. So it's, it's really, 
putting heavy restrictions uh, onto the uses. I'd also mention we did review the, the comments from the public and we'd note housing, Herving, uh, excuse me, the Irvington Housing Committee voiced its support again for diverse housing stock. And that diversity of housing stock does include assisted living and they note it uh, in their letter. This is a, this one is a, a I, I had to think about this one, but I also hear the assisted living facilities generate very few school children. So I would, I would point that out um, for, for how they uh, limit their impacts on, on services. And we just lastly note uh, for this evening, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll be sure to put comments together. With respect to the multifamily development, we'd also note that the law doesn't presently include any mechanisms to encourage affordable workforce or below market. The phrases of how affordable housing are, are contemplated are many uh, and how they're defined, whether it's average me uh, area median income and the like uh, are many. Um, but you know, some of these other housing options uh, could include concepts like a density bonus, where if you build a certain number of below market rate units, or even if you build additional market rate units over what your code contemplates, additional market rate units would allow the development to be viable and encourage more affordable units. Um, another tool that some uh, communities in, in, in river towns use are the fee and lieu provision. So similar to what you might find in a parking regulation, where if you can't provide the parking, you either go get a variance or in this case to encourage uh, you know, either a fund where the municipality may be uh, developing affordable housing, uh, there may be a fee in lieu of these below market rate units, which collectively those uh, drive more units, not necessarily only on the premises, but at other areas uh, that the village might find uh, appropriate. So again, we'd really appreciate, um, you know, you're taking our comments, you know, we're, we're hopeful um, you know, that again, all this work uh, reviewing these uses and, and understanding that the market will really drive uh, what happens on these properties. You're not going to have six assisted living facilities. That that just doesn't make sense or relate to this uh, area of the community. Um, but we hope uh, those those uses will remain in the code and we'll, we'll certainly be here uh, if we can provide other illustrative examples to help further this uh, discussion. Great, thanks. Um, Okay, you have uh, uh, Peter Buderi. Yes. Yeah, Peter. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I really just had two <clears throat> uh, clarifications that I wanted to ask to understand the new draft. The first one had to do with the change in the definition of lot coverage, which seems to, previously lot coverage counted the impervious surfaces. Now it says it's all the buildings on the site, which seems to be the same as building coverage. So I wanted to understand if that was intentional, you're not going to uh, regulate impervious surfaces anymore, and if so, What's the difference between all buildings, which is your definition of lot coverage, and all principal and accessory buildings, which is your yeah? Well, the way, um, Peter, the reason it's that way is it is a little the, the zoning code's definition of building is a little counterintuitive. A building is anything that sits on the ground, anything composed and sits on the ground, and it includes fences, it includes retaining walls um it actually even includes driveways so so that's why that's why this had to be broken out by here we meant building coverage 20 percent of what what's commonly understood as buildings like the building itself and 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 a garage or an out, another outbuilding and um and in, in in our code pervious and impervious are counted the same they're all it's all counted so you're saying a paved driveway is a building and that's why it, it is still is counted as lot coverage? Just a, a paved It counts as parking. lot coverage, but not as building coverage. So that's the distinction between the 20% and the 30%. It's 20% for kind of commonly understood buildings, 30% for any other coverage. All right, so I'll move to my second question of clarification. You're talking about, um, single family attached but well, from it's the coming way... out now anyway so my pardon the board wants to take that out yeah let me finish please so if you had three 
townhouses attached with three separate entrances. The way I read the definition of buildings, that would be a multifamily unit. The only thing you would be taking out if you take out single family attached would be semi-attached double residence. Is that the intention? And if so, that's the way it seems to read on the definition. No, well, single family attached was a new definition that was formulated actually to accommodate the um, development on the form of fee property. Uh, I don't have the code in front of me, and that this is the that, that's the definition it refers to. And there could sometimes there's two, sometimes there's three. I don't I don't think there was any limit. Maybe there was a limit on building length or something. So the multifamily that you want does not need to have one building entrance. It could have a separate building entrance from the outside for every unit. It could be if you have four. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think there's just one entrance. If you go on, on um, over on, on the, uh, the the half moon, pro is it half moon? Is that what those call the properties over? Those have separate entrances, don't they? Yes. That's multifamily. Yeah, you can have separate entrances. Yeah, 120 and 140 just to the yeah. north also have separate entrances. Yeah. All right. So I'm, I, I just really want to make it clear, then a town, a group of townhouses, like you have a field point where you have five townhouses in a row, they're single families, right? They're all fee simple, single family. They're, at, they're, at, they're, at, they're attached single family. I mean, I think they would fit that definition, but they when they came into the code, there wasn't that definition. I think they were approved as clusters. Okay, I'm just... Uh, I'm just suggesting that by the definitions in the zoning, which I looked at, that would be that would count as your three or more family. And uh, I don't know, you you would. It's sort of an academic exercise because the board's not not going to go forward with that. So. Well, it. It's but not if they do, I'll take a look at it. It's not academic if that's a multi-family. If they're approving that, then. I just want to know if that's if that's what they're approving as multifamily. That's what that's what the board's proposing. They I want think, multifamily. I think okay, the, so. I as long as it's more than two units attached to each other, it's it's okay. I think he's saying you could end up with a with a a townhome of three units, and that would actually be- You know what, I, I'll have to look in the multifamily yeah. definition, okay. which I don't have in front of me, but if I understand it, 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 anyway, it's not two, it's three or more. I think, I don't think it's actually even called multifamily, it's called three or more dwellings, and then I would have to look. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Peter. Anybody else? Well, again, this isn't the uh, only time you'll have to discuss this. Um, it's not going to be the only time we discuss this. Cause I don't think we've made any decisions. Um, I mean, do, I mean, do we want to take some kind of straw poll to get Marianne working on it? Do we want to take the time until August to think about it? Um, you know, we're going to obviously need a new draft, um, and we're probably not going to announce it. You know, we won't, we won't probably have any public hearings till September anyway. But uh, so I don't know if people know more wanna... about the school. The school yeah. issues and some of the hanging things to just yeah, you know. I think you're right. I think I think it's better to get a little more information and then we can uh, have a little more informed decision in August. And plus, Marianne doesn't have to redraft anything right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. That part's easy. It's the trying to find out this stuff is the tough part. I just got to redraft. You guys decide and I'll redraft. But yeah, I'll, I'll get you. I'll get you something for the. I'll send it. I'll send an email around. Thank you. Thank you. No, so do we? Larry, is it possible to ask for uh, from the school district for something that would be just a list of addresses and account of bodies, no other identifying information that we could then use? You know, I mean, I'll do the spreadsheet work if that's required to turn that into, uh, you know, account by uh, multifamily uh, areas. Right. I can ask.
Okay. So again, I, I appreciate everyone, you know, continuing to follow this, this issue to continue to, you know, provide us with good thoughts, input, um, you know, uh, throughout this process. And, uh, you know, as we work on, on getting something, uh, you know, getting it as right as possible, for lack of a better term. Um, next up, Larry, is the amendment of the Irvington Volunteer Ambulance Corps Service Award Program. Um, while I slowly flip through my uh, online version of my uh, 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 agenda here, um, this, 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 this started during our budget process this year. Um, some of the members of the Ambulance Corps reached out to me to ask if they could have their, um, their rate of, you know, for their service award program catch up to the, the fire department. I guess the fire department had changed several years ago um, and they had not, which I was unaware of. Um, so I said, I'd be happy to consider it. Um, asked you to, uh, to research how much more it would cost to see if it was feasible. Um, and, you know, I think you uh, found out that it would be about, I think it was th about $4,000 a year more. Um, and it would increase their their award to uh, I guess thirty dollars per year of service after you know five years, that's per month, up to three hundred sixty dollars I believe. Right. Yeah. It actually, based on the current census, it's actually seven thousand six fifty is the uh, is the estimate of uh, of the increased benefit. Um, <laughs> And that, but again, that's based upon the number of volunteers they have, and and uh, and, and another fun part of this is that um, it actually has to be a referendum on the November ballot. So uh, you know we don't have a ton of time because we have to get it on the ballot, and then it only gets approved if the uh, if the residents of Irvington um, approve it. So we can and I apologize, Brian. The the um, the, the current cost is seven thousand six fifty. The the new cost, as you mentioned, is is about four thousand dollars higher. Eleven thousand six hundred would be the new cost. Apologize for that. No problem. I thought maybe I didn't have the updated numbers, but no, uh, no, no, you got it. <laughs> perfect. So I mean, that's that's the other added, uh, you know, kind of wrinkle in this that it's it's not all within our purview. Um, we can propose it, but they it has to be approved by the uh, the, the taxpayers. So um, this is the only monetary or, or this is the only official support we actually provide IVAC. We don't provide them with any equipment. Um, they are their own entity. They're not a village department. And I think a lot of people think that they're part of the village, but they're actually not. Um, so they, they have to provide all their own equipment and all their own, um, you know, vehicles. Um, you know, they, they now pay for per diem uh, members, um, you know, but to me, this is something that you know, A rewards the people that have been on the ambulance that, that are still performing the duties. And, you know, if it could help recruit a little bit, great. Um, if not, you know, it, it uh, benefits the folks that, that are still serving today. So um, I thought it was a great idea, but I, I will open it up to my board to see if anybody has questions or concerns or wants to talk about it. And I think we also, Larry, we feel we can, uh, we can, pay this out of contingency. So it's not like it's a. It, it, it's actually within the existing budget, right, Brenda? The, the um, yeah, the, the, the um, reality yeah. is, yeah, the reality is that we are a bit over budgeted because if, as they have, you know, somewhat declining numbers of volunteers that, that results in a lower payment on an annual basis. So our budget is a little bit over, you know, what we have actually been paying recently. Okay. Well, let me just add that any budget increase um, or any bill increase would be reflected next year, not okay. this so year, it's, it's not which is effective January 2021. Great. So it's not contingency. It would just be in a part of the regular budget process. Right. Next year's budget. Right. And hopefully we get so many volunteers that we have to worry about it. <laughs> that would be a good thing. Right. So, so if the, 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 the thing that, you know, seems uh, amazing that you know we can't just agree to this which you know we could agree to it but that it has to be on the ballot um is I, i'm gonna assume that this 
could be worked out. But I, I just realized that, you know, given the way we had to vote in the primary, where we didn't actually vote at our regular places, we voted in Dobbs Ferry. Um, if this is only to be voted on by Irvington residents, right? Is it the, and it's the village of Irvington. If you live in the village of Irvington, you would vote on this. So the ballot becomes, I don't know, different. You go to the place that you get your ballot. I, yeah, the, the, is well, something people could work out, but Larry, Larry and Mark will be on that ballot. So, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the ballots, the ballots are different, right, obviously, right, village right, by right, village. So, right, right. okay, right. <laughs> yeah. I was just trying to think, you know, the, the Dobbs Ferry person says, no, I don't vote on this. <laughs> Sorry, <yeah. laughs> or you maybe they want to. They like our, well, they like our ambulance corps, too. <laughs> well, I sure, I sure hope they have more than um, just a couple of uh, polling places for the presidential yeah. election, but what that's a whole other story. <laughs> but uh, I totally support um, this. I think it's an absolutely the right thing to do for IVAC. I completely support it. Okay, so I will. Uh, I well, I guess I'll I'll read it and then make a motion. So yeah, you, you got to run through it. Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> yeah, let me minimize all of you. Uh, whereas eligible voters of the village of Irvington approved preposition to establish a defined benefit service award program for active volunteers of the Irvington Volunteer Ambulance Corps effective January 1st, 2002, in accordance with Article 11 AAA of the New York State General Municipal Law. And whereas the program currently provides that an active volunteer member earns a year of service and $240 annual service award, i.e. a monthly service award of $20, for each calendar year during which the, such member earns 50 or more points under the service award program point system. And whereas section 219 N1E of article 11 AAA of the New York State General Municipal Law, law allows a municipal, municipal sponsor to select an annual service award of $360, for example, a monthly service award of $30. And whereas the members of the Irvington Volunteer Ambulance Corps approach the village board seeking an amendment to the service award program, and whereas section 219 L9 of Article 11 AAA authorizes the Village Board of Trustees to amend the program subject to approval of eligible voting residents for public referendum, whereas such improvement in public in program benefits is con consistent with the intent of the program to help the Irvington Volunteer Ambulance Corps recruit and retain active volunteers. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Village Board of Trustees is authorized by Article 11 AAA of the New York State General Municipal Law, hereby authorizes the public referendum of eligible voters residing within the Village of Irvington in an election to be held on November 3rd, 2020 between the hours of 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. at Board of at board of Elections designated polling places to determine if the Irvington Volunteer <laughs> Ambulance Corps, Inc. service award program shall be amended effective January 1st, 2021 to increase the annual service award from $240 to $360, i.e. A, a monthly service award increase from $20 to $30, and therefore increases the maximum accrued monthly service award from $800 to $1,200. And be it further resolved that monthly service award earned for years ending prior to January 1st, 2021 shall remain at $20, and monthly service awards earned for years beginning on or after January 1st, 2021 shall be at the $30 level, and be it further resolved that the average calendar year cost 2018 to 2020 of the Irvington Volunteer Ambulance Corps service award program was $7,650, about $850 per each participant earning the service credit during a program year. Should voters approve this amendment, the annual cost of the amendment amended program is projected to increase to approximately $11,600 for current participants earning service credit program during the year, about $1,290 per each participant earning service credit during a program year. This estimate assumes no increase in the number of participants earning service credit each year. Should there be an increase in participants serving service credits, the approximate additional cost to increase over 11,600 would be 1,290 per each additional volunteer earning service credit. All costs included include administrative fees, which are approximately $3,200, which will not change the result of amendment and, it, and be it further resolved that all other provisions of the Urban Volunteer Ambulance Corps Inc. Service Award Program, which require voter approval, shall not change that the program shall continue to be administered by the New York State Comptroller, according to Article 11, AAA of the New York State General Municipal Law, as such law is amended from time to time, as well as with applicable rules and regulations for defined benefit volunteer ambulance worker service program programs pro promulgated by the New York State Controller. I'll make the motion if I can have a second. Second. All in favor. Aye. Well, Aye. Brian, I dozed for a little bit of that. Can you read it again? <laughs> is it a particular session anyone liked? You know, this is written by an actuary, so I know there's a joke in there somewhere. Um, <laughs> the only people that us accountants can make fun of, Larry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>
Speaking of, of sexy, uh, you know, resolutions, <laughs> approval of an intermunicipal agreement with Westchester County for a hotline system. <laughs> yeah, th this is, a, well, as it said, it's an existing hotline that ties together the emergency services uh, in the county. And uh, the, the county... The county requires the uh, intermunicipal agreement. It's basically a renewal and uh, all of the terms and, and conditions that are in here are acceptable. So I don't even believe there's a cost to it. So this is 911 or other things besides 911 calls? It's not 911. It's, it's, a, it's a hotline. Um, Typically that, a stolen car or there's a, someone like that, like the, the police will announce, like you can call in and say, a car was just stolen in Irvington, have everyone look out for it. And they'll make the announcement throughout Westchester County. Right. Yeah, this is not the 911 system. This is a, a private hotline, if you will, for emergency agencies. Oh, so it's not for the public to use. It's for, yeah. Okay. No, okay. correct. At least this one short. Resolved to approve the interministerial agreement with the County of Westchester for a hotline system. I have a second, please. <laughs> Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, I think that one carried, Larry. Yeah, that was a close one. Um, next is approval of a consultant agreement with Brad Ogden for marketing services of the Irvington Theater. So during the, um, uh, during the budget process, uh, you approved a request to uh, um, allow the theater to en engage a marketing consultant or employee. Well, we weren't sure how, what form it would take, but um, they are uh, proposing, uh, they interviewed a number from what I understand, a number of uh, uh, possible consultants and they have a recommended contract with Brad Ogden, as you see, uh, and they're requesting approval of the contract. Larry, just, the Larry one thing on that contract, in yeah. the, um, I, I don't have it in front of me, but in the paragraph um, toward the bottom of the first page where it has the um, amount and, there, yeah. and then it says not to exceed, but cross that out because there isn't any not to exceed amount in this one. Yes, okay. And Larry, the paragraph above that where it talks about time of performance and term, uh, is the theater thinking to employ him now during this closed intermission point? Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They want to get started actually this coming month. So as you know, well, I mean, I, I can't speak all of the individual things that are going on in the theater. Um, but, you know, as you know, they're, they are trying to push a, uh, quite a, a virtual, um, you know, slate of programs uh, as well. So there's, there's work to be done there. Uh, at this point, but they are anxious to get started. Right. It is. Yeah, uh, yeah I, have, I have quite a bit of information from from Greg and uh, and the commission, but um, it has has a lot to do with trying to keep uh, people's awareness of the theater, which is harder to do and needs more marketing in a way than um, in in regular times. So yes, um, they they know they have to keep up a certain level of activities and. Um, an awareness so that when someday we can actually be together again in places, um, people will remember there's a theater there. Yeah. This is a one year contract. I, I read it, but I missed what the term of it is. It, um, I don't remember. It I, is, yeah. Yeah, tw it, it covers 12 months. So whenever okay, we get fine. started. That's yep. Yeah, that's fine. They, uh, yeah, they, they advertised in uh, Playbill and Arts Westchester, got a lot of responses. Um, it's a reflection on the current strained theater job market in a way. So it might be a good time to get somebody very good. Yeah, I, th I think they were very impressed with the, uh, with right. the applicant core, the, the group of applicants that they had. Right. All right. Uh, resolved to approve the consultant agreement with Brad Ogden for consulting services rel relative to the Irvington Theater Marketing Project and authorized the village administrator execute said agreement. Uh, I'll make the motion if I can get a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Like my, uh, I I've wasted all my reading skills on the uh, ambulance. 
word. <laughs> I'm really hung up on that one. I'm not sure why. Uh, next up. Um, ah. Ah, always an exciting one. Uh, approval of retainer agreement with Seshitz, Murphy, and Lammers for legal services. Um, <laughs> okay. You have to do this every year. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought if we bought 20, we got one free, but I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <a> t-shirt <laughs> Marianne we uh we appreciate all your hard work um and we're uh, happy to uh renew you absolutely yeah I'm not just saying this so you'll vote yes but you're the great client so <laughs> <laughs> well we uh I also didn't raise my rate so we appreciate it <laughs> <laughs> next year uh, <laughs> next year is the 20th free year now um, <laughs> so, okay so i think we can go ahead with this one except if anyone has anything else nice to say no, but, uh, I, I have something nice to say i think it's incredibly um wonderful to have somebody who knows so many people in so many agencies and around the county and the state and seems to be an expert on such diverse things that it takes a it takes a special mind to be good at a whole lot of things. Or a lot of years. <laughs> a lot of years too, but yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, so I guess. Thank you, Brian, Connie. You have to read, right, Brian? I do. Okay. Resolve to approve the retainer agreement 2020-15 with the firm of Steschitz, Murphy and Lammers, LLP providing for an hourly rate of $115 an hour for basic retainer services and $210 an hour for services outside of the basic retainer and authorize the mayor to execute said agreement. I'll make a motion if I can have a second. Second. Okay. All in favor. Aye. Aye. And that was 155, by the way, you said 115. Yeah, oh, so minute, she said she didn't raise her rate, she didn't lower it. So. <laughs> <laughs> give, him, give him a break. He's read so many numbers tonight. I know. <laughs> I'm telling you that I back thing. I left it all. I left it all there. Yeah. Approval of contract 2024-14 for community coalition coalition coordinator. Mm. So yeah, so th this is a uh, renewal of a contract with Lisa Tomini. Um, she's uh, she functions as the uh, coalition coordinator for the IASC coalition, uh, drug free communities. Um, this is 100% paid for uh, by grant funds, um, and, but she's the, uh, she's the executive director, if you will, um, keeping us uh, all in line in terms of grant compliance and, uh, you know, implementing or assisting with implementing programs that they want to run uh, that the coalition decides uh, and, and just, well, as the name says, she coordinates uh, the, the coalition and assists. So, uh, the contract is, uh, there, there's a, a small hourly rate increase here, but what's what's notable is that we're shifting, it's a 13 month contract because the federal government shifted their, mm -hmm. essentially the, the fiscal year for this particular grant. So uh, where it used to expire September 30th, now it's expiring uh, October 30th. So we're going for an extra month on this just to keep everything in sync. Mm -hmm. and, and by the way, we're part way through the year. In fact, most of the way through the year, but, <laughs> Uh, you know, th a lot of things had to take place to try to figure out what exactly her role would be because the coalition, you know, has had to change somewhat during this, this yeah. these last four months in terms of the types of things they could actually do. So that's it. What, uh, this was a multi-year grant, but what year are we in, in that multi-year grant? Yeah, so there, the grants are awarded in five-year blocks. Um, we just finished last year in October of 19. We just finished the first five-year block. Oh. We reapplied for the next five-year block and ultimately got it, although it was a late announcement. So everyone was up in the air on pins and needles, but, um, but we did get another five years. Now we, we technically have to apply each year for a renewal or a, uh, a reaward of, of each of the years, but they're, they're typically reawarded as long as you're complying. Right. with the requirements um and lisa's a big part of us staying compliant <laughs> that's the important thing right. well, so yeah so so we're in for you we just we're in the middle of year one or towards the end of year one of the for, of the next second five-year block so year six we're calling it 
But it's a maximum of 10 years, I believe, right, Larry? And yeah, maximum is 10, exactly. Okay. It's yeah. usually Tanya Hunt and... Um, and uh, um, Allison Felix. Allison, Allison Felix. Allison is, are here, but... They are... They're out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is, this is uh, a little bit of housekeeping from, from this standpoint, you know, just to get all the paperwork in order, so... Right. It's not, you know, this is not a brand new uh, consultant for us. No, okay. Resolved to hire Lisa K. Tomini to, as a community coalition coordinator for seven, 788 hours of work per year at the annual salary of $39,433, effective October 1st, 2019 through October 30th, 2020. She will be extended for an additional one year term by mutual agreement, which authorizes the bill's administrator to execute said contract. I'll make a motion if I can have a second. Second. All in favor. Aye. All right. Uh, next up is a um, resignation from the ethics board. Uh, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Um, we actually got a letter from uh, Marianne uh, Noble that she was uh, moving out of town, so she has to uh, resign effective immediately. Um, so resolved to accept with regret the resignation of Marianne Noble from the Ethics Board, effective July 20th, 2020. We thank her for her service and, you know, we'll work on uh, getting a, a suitable replacement soon. I'll make a motion if I can have a second. 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 All in favor. Aye. 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 Yes, I extend my, my good wishes to her too. She's done a lot in the community and we're sorry to lose her from Irving. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, the whole family, Marion, Roger, Alex, yes. and Jimmy. Oh. Incredible um, family. They've been great residents and, and friends to all of us. Yeah. And now we'll go on to approval of the 2019-20 budget transfers and modifications, which was a late addition to our show tonight. <laughs> so that was circulated around earlier today. Um, were there any, any questions about the transfer memo? I think, Mark, you had a question on the capital, which is the next one. But um, yeah, let um, me just pull, pull it up again. I hope I didn't to see if there was a question on the transfer. I don't think there was, but I can, second. I'm, yeah. I can probably put it on the screen if that helps. Okay. That's good. Sure, let me try. I asked my question earlier and you answered it, so I'm good. Right, right, yep. Uh, let's see here, okay. So, so, okay, that's the uh, budget transfer resolution. I, can, well, um, most I had of them one are to amend the budget uh, where we, we received reimbursements um, and helped to offset expenses. So those resulted in budget amendments um, that uh, I needed when I prior to the audit, which was uh, two weeks ago. And Could then you we adjusted explain? the budget for 86 Main Street. I'm just reading a, along some of the highlights there. Could you explain number nine? Transfer from general fund contingency for police overtime. It says contingency overtime budget 25K. Is that what we had allocated? Um, in, in it was already yeah. in contingency 25,000, correct. And um, there was a transfer of 89,000 at the end of all of their operations in police to um, for additional overtime, but there was already 25,000 in the contingency. So it was really um, 89 minus 25 was the amount that was really, that really impacted the budget because you already had 25,000 set aside in contingency for overtime. Right, and that, and and I know we talked about this during the budget process, but that um, the explanation on that is simply that um, you know we we went uh, on a plan basis. We went uh, for you know many months um, from from April, which actually predates the last fiscal year, but from April until the end of December, where we had uh, two officers down because of retirements and we were waiting for the new officers to finish their rookie school. So, you know, those, those slots had to be filled with overtime. Now this, you know, the salaries were down as well, but so, but the net the netted out to these types of numbers. Okay, yeah. But that's I, that to 64,000 yeah. after all of the vacancies we had, we had right. a, uh, one pretty long-term um, absence due to illness 
and we had several workers comp um, absences. Right. So we yeah. did receive reimbursement, and you can see them in here too, reimbursements for workers comp to help, help offset the overtime. Yeah, I had forgotten about those discussions. That makes sense now, thank you. Okay. Any other questions about this one? I'm just scrolling down to the bottom here, but. Okay, Brian. Resolved to adopt the following budget transfers for Cisco. Oh, and we're, we were gonna talk about the other one. Yeah, well, we're, we're, just, we're just doing this one first, so. Sorry. One, one at a time. Resolved to adopt the following budget transfers for fiscal year 2019 2020 as detailed below and discussed. I'll make a motion if I can have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, let me uh, call up the other one. Okay. Okay, so this is uh, a resolution to close out various capital projects, um, you know, where for the most part there's excess balances remaining. There's a few deficits here, but um, the overall would then um, be transferred to uh, the debt service fund to, right. to be used to pay off the, the debt service that was borrowed for these projects, these various projects. Right. Yeah, my comment I made before was, you know, there's a few of these sprinkled through, but some of them seem to have, I don't know if they were considered to be contingency, like 56, six left over from the fuel tank spill, whatever that was. And is the number before 2004, is that the year that it yes. was assigned? Correct. That yes. was the year it was bonded. Yeah, so then I was looking down at the, um, the water fund seems to have a very high uh, number um, in terms of uh, a lot of excess, I guess it's contingency, it's stuff that didn't have to get spent. Um, you know, I took a little opportunity. I didn't do all of them, but I did the water one. Um, I don't know the particular reason on the low service transfer tank, whether it just came in under budget or what happened. But if you add up the original bonding, it comes to about 12% of the original bonding. So, the, I mean, the bonds were very high and they spanned a long period of time. I think the uh, general fund, the, the non-water would be even less than that, but that water, even taken in that 57,000, it came in at 12% of the total bonding, which is done before the bids come in. Right, so we're, we're gonna, we take, you know, typically, um, for let's, I mean, not, not the purchase of a vehicle, but let's talk about a regular project. So we, we will ask the engineers to estimate the project. Um, and then it, as we normally do, we build in, um, you know, contingency into that. Uh, because as Brenda said, at that point, the project hasn't been bid yet. So we, we don't know where it's going to come in. They haven't put a shovel in the ground yet. So um, in, the, in the case of some of these water projects, we were, we were fortunate and they were managed properly and, and we came in under budget. Um, you know, there's other examples. I mean, Hudson V Park is, is a perfect example of a project that didn't come in under budget because of the amount of rock we encountered. So well, you know, these I'm are- Well, I'm actually not trying to yeah, criticize yeah. the budgeting process. I just wanted to better understand it. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that, so that's it. range, that's really a reasonable contingency uh, Factor, you know, ten to fifteen percent is reasonable to have on these these kinds of unknowns. Right. And that brings up a second question, just on the fly, which is, what's going on on the Main Street curb replacement project? That thing has gotten. You must be really eating into contingency. Um, not well. No, not not yet. I mean, or I should say that the jury's still out on all that. Um. For, for as much as, you know, there, there's definitely one uh, uh, one area that has to be corrected, we, which we know about, which is the Grinnell uh, area. Um, you know, some of the other uh, issues, um, you know, we're, we're correcting them and, and really paying a lot of attention to the grades before anything's poured, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, even even little things, as you saw this week, uh, you know, dealing with the with with the tree wells and 
making sure that we pour correctly around those. So, you know, we're trying to do that where it's, it's, it's not costing anything other than some, some engineering time ahead of time to make sure it's done correctly out in the field. Oh, I thought, um, yeah. You know, I thought you had mentioned that there were some surprises in the stormwater stuff. It looked like some very large uh, excavations were going on that were beyond, beyond just the curbs themselves, but sort of like were in, yeah. in the stormwater system. Yeah, no, those those, uh, those are relocations of, uh, well, a hydrant tomorrow, but uh, relocations of um, storm storm drains. Yeah, and that was all and expected. Those were all in the plans, yeah, though those were not unexpected. So, you know, for as much as there, there are some corrections that have to be made, um, there are also areas where we're saving money. So, you know, there's areas where we thought they might be replacing a fair amount of sub base below the, the sidewalks and uh, they're not replacing as much as, as we had anticipated. So there's savings there and the engineer is tracking that exceptionally sharp closely. So, um, so we'll see, I mean, the, the, the wall on station road will be, it will be an extra, I don't know the magnitude yet, but, um, the, well, there's the, always going to be an open question, right? I mean, yeah, the, and it's right now it's, you know, we haven't, we haven't negotiated the price on that one yet. So there'll be an extra for that, but I don't, um, at this point, I'm not uh, sounding the, the alarm bell. So we'll see how it all settles out. Could you scroll down a little bit? What's, what are some of the numbers on the top of this? I can't find my email right now. I think I erased it already, but I'm you trying to figure out. To see the top. All right. Scroll down. Oh, up here. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how we got from, now you can go back up to the bottom numbers. How did we get to from 24,000 Right. It's not, it's, it's 240, it's 243,000. 243,000, sorry. I'm, I'm yeah. not my comma. No, no, it's in the wrong spot. Yeah. It's that and, comma. Oh, it's 243,000, never mind. It's a typo, yeah, it's a typo. No, it's, it, it's the comma's in the wrong spot. That's why I've asked Brenda to use only Roman numerals going forward to make it easier. <laughs> okay, never mind, I don't have a question. My eye was fooling me, I hadn't caught the extra digit. Yeah, yeah. I it does add up. I was trying to find the negative in there to, to offset some of those big ones, and they couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of negatives, but not, yeah, no, not that big. The 57 and the 35, but yeah. So we have a, a lot this year because we uh, had permanent financing last year. While we had the bands and we were, were renewing them for five years, we couldn't do these transfers until we had permanent financing. Otherwise, they would have been closed out sooner. So this was a um, particularly you know, large amount of transfers this year, but it will be used as Larry mentioned to offset future debt, debt service payments. Good. Okay. Whereas the village says I'm taking certain capital projects which have been completed and there exists no further liabilities, resolve to close the following list capital projects and authorize a transfer of unexpended funds to the debt service, debt debt service fund and to provide funding for project deficits from general fund balance effective May 31st, 2020. Uh, total non-water transfers, $243,074.81. Total water transfers, $159,947.47. And total transfers to debt service fund, $403,022.28. I'll make the motion if I can have a second. Second. Okay. All in favor. Aye. All right. Next up, reports of boards, standing committees, and officers. Trustee liaison reports. Should we go out of different order? Should I go in the order that we're in Zoom tonight? Sure. Be, I think it's different for everyone. <laughs> oh, that would be Larry Lonke is my first up. <laughs> well, there's not much. Just very briefly, um, if you're not aware, the farmer's market's been running every Sunday. It's been great. They've done a wonderful job of, of maintaining... Uh, social distancing and the vendors are back. So please come to that. Uh, and then just be aware that Parks and Rec are working to have open playgrounds. Um, tennis courts continue to be open and they're working on more and more programming uh, as soon as it can safely be uh, started. Um, Larry, you just want to talk a little bit about that sign up? 
that, that we were talking about with Connie uh, earlier, the online? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. So um, as you said, they, uh, they are starting up some limited programs, uh, the ones they can do um, as safely as possible. Uh, music with Mark, for example, there's a, there's some oh. other, I'm sorry. I said, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, th that'll be an outdoor one. Uh, but there's, there's a few other programs that they're looking to start up. And I think they also are going to be getting back into um, youth baseball and, uh, and the adult softball as well. Um, and uh, this year for the first time, uh, a long awaited um, online registration process. Um, there's no need for anyone to come to the recreation department to sign up. Um, no paper, no checks, although I guess they'll take a check if they need to, but everything's paid online uh, in an automated way. So uh, I'm sure there'll be some growing pains, but uh, Mike DiNardo is uh, all over uh, implementing that. And, uh, and we waited until Joe was out of the office to implement it. <laughs> I'm only I'm only kidding. Joe Joe has been very supportive of it, actually. I tried it out. That's what I was. I tried it out, even though I didn't want to sign up for music with Mark. I didn't think I met the age requirements. But <laughs> exactly. So anyway, that's good news, and it'll be uh, a real um, improvement going forward, especially as they start ramping back up to normal operation, whenever that is. Um, and I think that the uh, residents will appreciate the convenience yeah, in the long run. Kudos mm -hmm. to them, uh, definitely. Yeah. You're good, Doc? Janice, you're up next on my, my screen. Okay, I just had from the fire department, um, as of their June 25th meeting, 30 calls to date for June and 139 for the year. Um, training continues a couple each month, hazmat, Collier's mansions, firefighter safety, large volume hose training and appliances. I was very impressed that they're stressing social distancing and face masks for every activity, the training, the meetings, the maintenance. Uh, monthly maintenance was on Saturday the 11th. Um, uh, coming up is hose testing and aerial testing. And to nobody's great surprise, the birthday party drive-by events have been a huge hit. So if you want to participate, please let them know. It doesn't seem like there's an age requirement. <laughs> so <laughs> anybody having a birthday, let them know. You might get some balloons flying off the truck. Good to know. Excellent. Mark, I have you next. Except if you're not there, then we yep, he's back. <laughs> <laughs> you're muted. You're muted. Okay, do you want me to go? Because I'm not. No, no he's good. He's good. Okay. <laughs> Didn't take that long to mute or unmute with the space bar. So, um, GPTF is back at collecting um, food waste, food scrap, food compost at the market during the regular market hours. So, uh, they're in the parking lot uh, closer to Main Street. And um, you know, not only are they collecting food scraps, but they're also selling containers and selling um, uh, biodegradable bags and stuff. So, um, you know, it's good to see them back at it now that the market's back functioning again. Um, number two was that um, the Tree Commission, if you don't know certain neighborhoods, um, they would like to call your attention to the fact that Con Ed is coming through with another round of tree pruning going on. Uh, from what I see, most of it right now tends to be along uh, Upper Harriman and down. I mean, I have not seen all the various neighborhoods yet, um, but um, Cedar Ridge for one I know is uh, on the list. Um, the Tree Commission and the uh, uh, DPW is looking at a list of trees that Con Ed would like to remove and they are going to be given, giving them back their decision about that. Those would be trees that are not on private property but on um, village property and uh, Con Ed has to get approval uh, from the village to do any kind of removal. Um, and finally, this is a reminder to Larry, um, if I may, which is at our next regular meeting when we're going to be talking about have a public hearing, I suppose, on the 
uh, leaf blowers, gas leaf blower ban. Um, I'd still like to have, if possible, have Joe come in and give us a recap of his experience, uh, you know, with the electric stuff, where it works, where it doesn't work, what kind of issues. I mean, we just have to have a good understanding from his experience. I think we could learn uh, learn more about the constraints. Sure. Thank you. Do. And Connie. Ah, oh, uh, so we've heard about the theater. I can report a little more on that. Um, the, you know, there's both the commissioners and then there's the friends of the theater. And these are two volunteer groups that work closely with the, the theater director, Greg Allen. Um, and as I mentioned, their, their, their need for keeping people aware of what's going on and creating programs is not that easy. But now I understand that Mayor Brian Smith is part of a program here. It'll about, be a game changer, I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is a good one. It's, it's the wonderful book that Greg wrote about the squirrel who got into the theater. And I won't tell anymore, but you're involved. You're not the squirrel, I guess, but <laughs> it sounds like a fun thing. It's gonna be in September. Uh, they, are, they are also doing some little interior work. Um, I think when we end up discussing a capital budget, that will be part of that big website redesign. Um, and this sounds so exciting to me, this class they have, I, I forget, 15 people maybe signed up. Kids learn how to make a one minute film on a social justice topic. Um, and they take the course obviously virtually and it, it sounds like such a great experience for, for kids. Um, I'd like to learn how to do that too. Uh, and they're doing their solo series, a lot of things on the YouTube channel. So that's the theater. There was something from Greg uh, Nilsson, uh, trustee report. I think this is it. Um, let's see, Greg, if I got this sent to Karen, um, July 20th, um, highway department action, replace curbs with precast concrete on Hancock Place, install precast concrete curbs on Bargo Lane and Field Terrace, replace damaged curbs on Circle Drive, replace collapsed catch basin, um, that was uh, Meadowbrook Road and Fargo Lane, uh, replace the damaged sidewalk and curb on South Ecker. Um, a whole lot of other things here. About 10 more things that they did, moving trees, helping different groups, prepared for and cleaned up after tropical storm and heavy rain and thunderstorms limbed down blocking roads at various locations. So there were several other things in there, but you all know that Greg and his crew are always working away um, within the village and we appreciate it. That's the end of my report. Excellent. Um, next up is the village administrator's report. So just, um, just a quick note that the um, electric vehicle charging equipment arrived today at Village Hall. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> now it's now it's got to be put in. So, uh, you know, all of that was delayed um, uh, by the uh, uh, supply chain issues related to the pandemic. Um, some of it was uh, coming from overseas and other parts were from California and eventually it all arrived today. So um, the uh, village excavator, contractor and electrician will be hard at work, hopefully over the course of the month of August. And, um, you know, I've, I've I'm going to try to push them to get it done by the end of that month. Um, so we'll see how that goes. The um, the other thing is, uh, I know I'd, le I'd let you know about a uh, potential grant application for the uh, what we're calling the Aster Gateway um, uh, project uh, or partial project anyway. Um, another project that we've submitted for is uh, that we, we became aware of another $50,000 of what's called multimodal funding. Uh, through the New York State Department of Transportation. And uh, we have identified the stretch of sidewalk along South Broadway um, from the driveway into Columbia, uh, going south towards, uh, you know, right where the, the sycamore trees start, <laughs> which I guess you could 
you can picture that stretch, which is incredibly deteriorated section of, of sidewalk that is in desperate need of repair. So we've submitted for that. We'll see how it goes. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned, I think in an email to the board, the um, availability of funding is questionable. It's discretionary type funding, you know, from the state is, um, and whether any new money is going to be awarded, I have no idea. I think they're putting holds on some of the existing money that they've awarded already, and they're putting holds on that money going out. So we'll see what happens. That's it. Very good. Village Clerk Treasurer's Report. Uh, tomorrow's the last day for anyone who hasn't paid their taxes uh, to please pay. Um, you may pay through tomorrow penalty free. After that day, it'll be a 5% penalty. So it was an extension because of the COVID um, you know, problem. Uh, we had our annual audit, um, not last week, the week before, it went very smoothly. Uh, we were very well prepared for it. Uh, there were no surprises. I believe the village will come in as anticipated with a very substantial increase to fund balance. Uh, we have said about 700,000, so we'll come in about that. Uh, we'll give a more you know, comprehensive report by each fund later on, probably in October. Great, great news. <laughs> yeah, n nice not to have a surprise. No surprises. Village attorney's report. No report. Public comment. If anyone wants to raise their hand. Maybe we review action items while we wait. <clears throat> so uh, one of the action items for sure is to contact the school regarding um, their roster. I won't call it demographics, but uh, you know, whatever information they can give us. Um, and then also to schedule Joe to come in um, to the, uh, when you're considering the uh, leaf blower law. Great. No hands. I will make a motion to adjourn if anyone can give me a second. second, second. All in favor. Aye. Have a great rest of the week, everyone. Okay. okay thank you. Can I Larry, can I talk yes. to you for just a minute? Larry, a shopper. Uh, can you just, can you call my cell phone? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I'll just be a minute. Okay. Okay. Thank oh, you. Okay, Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.